Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined by your host, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And as always, we couldn't make these episodes happen without the help from our sponsors. C's here now, number one seed bank in the industry, all the hottest breeders, the latest drops, and a guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Why would you go anywhere else? They guarantee you'll be happy with the end results of the grow. What more could you want? Well, you need to make sure that your harvest is on point. And to do that, you want to make sure that your garden is happy, healthy, pest and pathogen free. And in order to do that, you need to check out our buddies at Coppet Biological Systems. These guys have all the best predators in the game, from the Afiparem if you've got aphids, to the Spidex Vital if you've got spider mites. Get it now, guys. Keep your garden pumping on all pistons, pest and pathogen free. Trust me, guys. Nothing better than knowing your garden is clean. As always, shout out to our friends down under holding down the fort. Organic gardening solutions for your organic gardening needs. Best soil in the game is what I use. Check them out. Or if you're looking for some of my genetics, go to Top Shelf Seed Bank. They've got a great range of both domestic and international breeders. Go check them out if you're after some of my work. And last but not least, huge shout out to the Patreon gang. You guys are truly the lifeblood of the show. Without you, episodes could not happen. If you're interested in helping support the show, all while getting early access to episodes, unheard additional content, prizes and giveaways, check out the Patreon. Heck, we just gave away 30 packs of Hashplant 13 cross to the Puck Back Cross 1 from Crickets and Cicada. They were generous enough to donate it to us and our fans got those for free. Go check out the Patreon today, guys. On this episode, we're lucky to be joined by Gas of Swami Organics. Here to talk breeding, history, plans for the future, and so much more. Without further ado, let's get into it. Alrighty, friends, we're back for another one. And on this one, we are joined by the man behind Swami Organic Seeds, the old school genetic guru himself, Gas. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well, my friend. The The first question we love to ask our guests, what have you been smoking on lately? Well, you know, I just had some NL5 Haze <laughs> along with a Foster's, bro. <laughs> <laughs> god that's so funny that you bring up the fosters it's like uh i don't know if you know this but like it's it's not really sold in australia but it's sold everywhere outside of australia yeah i'm not a, i'm not a real big fan of it but you know i just <laughs> there it was <laughs> you know i appreciate it you know putting in the uh the effort for the australian <laughs> chat i love it okay and it's it's so interesting that you mention that you're smoking the nl5 haze you know it's uh such a sort of trending strain at the moment. How would you describe the effect of that? Well, it just depends on who you are, really, because it's quite introspective, you know. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody with anxiety issues. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody who has any kind of bipolar or mental disorders or anything like that, because it can take a normal human being and turn them into a freaking nut in, a, in, a, in seconds. They'll, they'll, they'll be walking through glass. They'll be dry. They'll be crashing the ditch. You know, they'll forget to water the dog. They'll, it's just one of those things. And that's why the, the warning is still there, you know, and it's, I don't find it extremely comfortable to smoke it, but I'll take a pull here and there, you know, just, it's, it's a, it's a good tasking thing. If you don't get too far into it, you know, <laughs> Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I know that for a number of years, I certainly really couldn't go near some of the strongest sativas I enjoy nowadays. Um, and I, I think that in part, that was probably because I had a lot of sort of general anxiety at that time. But interesting nowadays, it's sort of one of those things I gravitate to more. So it's it's funny, I imagine having a conversation with myself, you know, five, 10 years ago, and, and like, you couldn't pay me to smoke nl 5 as <laughs> right and and you're, you you really hit the the nail on the head right there it's it's a state of mind yeah you know i can I'd smoke anything 
you know, around the globe. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, there's nothing to be afraid of ever. It's all what society put there. Oh, it's illegal. Oh, no, it's illegal. So automatically your brain set up for failure, you know. So if you avoid those those thought processes of of oppressing nature, then you're going to do well. You're going to do way better. And then you can do anything in the world, you know, smoke anything, smoke, smoke all the Highland ties, smoke all the Africans. Yeah, it's going to give you some anxiety. But, you know, if you're skilled at what you do, you're going to find a way to deal with it. And you're going to go out and put that to use, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, yeah, finding a way to make it work for you. I certainly can jive with that. I would be interested to know because I was I was pondering this last night as I was writing some questions for our chat. I've spoken to a few people who have sort of touched on this idea but never fully gone there. So I wanted to ask you specifically, do you think NL5 Haze is one of, if not the ultimate expression of cannabis? No. It's just one of those things that made its way into history at a time when uh, the DEA was really harsh on, on everybody in the United States, you know, and how Neville introduced the NL5s and, and all that to us over here in the United States, that really changed the game over here. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I know what Roadkill Skunk was. I know we were buying bags in Northern Lights. We we're, you know, it was all here. But what dominated everything here was Killer Green Bud. It sidelined in all five haze and, and anything that came around, you know, because all the local growers were growing this Puget North, you know, this, this Puget weed, whatever the hell that was. But it's, it's, it's just different. It's totally different. Um, I've been wondering this myself for the past week or so. Is Killer Green Bud the same as Kentucky Bluegrass? You know, I just don't know because it's possible that somebody actually did take something out of the Pacific Northwest back then. But when we were growing up as kids, it was everywhere. That's all you had. That was all you bought. Everybody was growing it. It was everywhere. And it had a really pungent indica kind of it was it reminded me of California orange quite a bit, you know, but it had more of a garlic thing going on. And it's very well could be uh, in our lines and in that killer green bud, too. My parents knew Steve Murphy, too. Oh, okay. You think maybe it comes from Steve Murphy? I don't know. You know, he, what he gave people, it spread around, and the imports had a lot to do with it, too, because the Brotherhood imports were coming up there. You know, my parents had Panama, Colombian, Thai stick. I remember being in fifth grade and unraveling the, the twine off the Thai stick, man. You know, we smoked that shit and... <laughs> Oh, boy, I thought I was in trouble for the next universe, you know? (laughs) Oh, man, I think everyone listening to this right now is uh, a little bit collectively jealous of your childhood after hearing that. Well, it it was my parents that had a lot to do with it. I was born into the culture, you know. My dad unloaded tankers of uh, Mexican weed in North Hollywood in 1966 at 18 years old and got paid by my grandpa to do it. So it's just been something that was in the family for a long time, just working with the biker side of the, the gig, the brotherhood of eternal love. What people don't realize is they were bikers and surfers, and they'd made a pact to work with each other, not work against each other. So that's what they called the brotherhood of eternal love. Yeah. O- often we hear hell's angels thrown around. Do you think that it was like sort of them and then a group of hippies and they combined together and then that made the brotherhood? It was the, it was up in the Pacific Northwest. It was specifically the Bandito faction of the Hells Angels. Yes. You know, many nights I'd wake up when I was a kid and they just all roll out there, you know, 300 strong and fire off all their Uzi and just, just leave, you know, but that's who brought us the roadkill. That's who brought the roadkill out, out to us. And I remember seeing it growing when, you know, in 1981, 82, I remember watering the plants. I remember picking buds off the plants and taking them to school and smoking them with my friends, you know. And that's how I got busted with this stuff. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. So many avenues we're going to have to loop back on. I guess before we get into the roadkill skunk too much, because I would love to pick your brain on it, I just wanted to quickly ask the KGB, the killer green bud, any speculation as to what the genetics might have been? It was an Afghani, probably a Mexican. Because, you know, or Colombian, I would say, too, you know, 
because there was a lot of Colombian imports. Most of the herb that was coming in back then in the late 70s was Colombian, brown, dark, black Colombian, cheap, plentiful, fat sacks, good weed. Yeah, wow. And just because I'm a little out of touch with the timeline, was this before, like, the commercial release of Skunk One? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I hadn't, I, I never heard of Skunk One until probably 1987 or 88. And by then, I'd, I was already incarcerated, had already gone through the ringer with, with Roadkill, you know. And when Skunk One came out, and I smelled it, and I grew it, and I looked at it, man, I thought it was a joke, you know, because... It wasn't skunk at all. It was just a plant that seemed to melt under every condition that we put it in. It would melt in the frost. It would melt in the heat. It would melt and just melt. You know, these, these, weren't, these weren't the Pacific Northwest genetics that we knew. Yeah, I've never been a fan and still not. <laughs> it's just not a real skunk. So what, what is the RKS to you? Is it like a, a pure Afghani? How would you describe it? It was probably, yeah. HC says it was a pure Afghani and I believe him because everything he told me corresponds to the timeline that my parents were associated with this gig. So I trust what he's saying. And I would say he's probably right that it's a pure Afghani, but it could have an import in it. We don't know. When I was growing those plants in 81, they were thin. Okay. They were thin leaf. They weren't wide, fat leaves. And they would get black and green when the cold hit them. Lots of purple in the buds, you know, uh, more of a, a Christmas tree indica profile. Like uh, if you look at the old catalogs, the old indicas, it looked a lot like that. It was probably a Hindu. One of the things we've heard from other people who have come on the show is obviously they're not stating it with certainty, but they've said, you know, there, there might have been a, a few things that had that aroma and, you know, not just one specific clone. Where do you sit on that one? Absolutely. You know, I've, I've grown just about everything from around the world, you know, um, and not just one or two at a time. I grow a bunch. And um, I've seen a lot of the, that skunk pop up in a lot of different things. But what I see it pop up in most is uh, unmolested Hindu type stuff. You know, the higher altitude Afghani Pakistan Hindu stuff. Just that's where I see it. Yeah, okay. And, you know, people often say that the reason why roadkill disappeared was because people were getting busted. Is, is that your thoughts on why we sort of saw it vanish? Um, it's probably at least 70 to 80% of the reason, yeah. Because it was so loud. It was so stinky, man. You were just done. You're done. You're not getting away, you know. They're going to track you down through scent. <laughs> Yeah, it was impossible. It really was. It was quite difficult. Yeah, look, I can only imagine pre-carbon filters, the anxiety level must have been through the roof. Well, it, I got cracked. I did two weeks in juvie for it. So, you know, and, I, and we did know growers that were getting cracked. And, and it, you'd be driving down the street and smell it, you know. You just knew that house right there, <laughs> you know. Duh. So we, we've seen like a huge, over the past probably three, four years now, this huge resurgence in people looking for the roadkill skunk. Do you think it's the type of thing where we will ever find it again? And if we do, would you think we should try to breed it from scratch again or go back on old seeds and try to hunt it through that? Well, I've done both. I've, I've, I've got, I have a five-year RKS project going now, and we're just about done with it, actually. And... um. We looked at a lot of stuff, man. We went through a lot of things, a lot of old land races, a lot of old types. uh, And it just boiled back down to the original lines. It really did, you know. So, but of course, I had to outcross to get it back, you know. I'm using an 85 Humboldt roadkill that was taken to Mexico in 1985. Dude stopped by Humboldt, bought a bag, went straight to Mexico, gave it to his sister, She smoked the weed, took the seeds out of it, gave it to her local farmer who's, you know, doing exports. And he crossed it to that type, which was a European type, Uruapan. It's outside of, uh, uh, oh man, I forget. But anyway, um, it's a good region for growing good herb. And it's noted for that. The seeds were sent back in 2017 
and I only got two males. They were pretty big. Yeah. So, you know, so I figured I'd just cross up, outcross them to my oldest types in the hopes that I could grab that genotype in there somehow by waking it up with these old types, you know, with Mr. Green Jeans, Cherry Bomb, with Coots, Blue Orca, and, and with this purple Zeep, which had Blue Mystic in it and the purple Roadkill Skunk in there, you know, and that one was pretty good, but that, that was more of a poly from Nirvana than just an old unmolested type, you know. And it did, it worked, but it wasn't, I, I had to go through a lot of seeds. So I did F2 of the Blue Orca by the 85 Roadkill Uruapan and just searched through it massively of those. And we found what we were looking for with going, yep, this is it. This is what it looks like. This is what it smells like. Let's hope that if we cross it back to one of these 63 breeder packs that HC gave me, that we can wake up that genotype. And that's all we got, man. Honestly, unless you're going to go out there in the world and go search for unmolested types for that skunk phenotype and then bring those types back to the United States and sit there and work and work them and work them and work them together. It's just nobody's ever going to find that, you know, unless they don't unless they don't have it, you know. Yeah, it, it's interesting because that, that sounds like it could well be a nice recipe for success. And we've heard other people sort of use alternative routes and looking through what they consider to maybe be like really early skunk releases. I guess I'd be interested in hearing, Do you, you know, a lot of people say that at a certain point, pretty early on in the grand scheme of things, Sam bred it from stinky to sweet skunk. Do you think there ever was a stinky skunk? That's what they say, but I just I, I think Sam's bullshit, man. I think that guy's just shit, dude. Everything he said, he tried to sell out the industry. You know, he's a known liar. I mean, he, all his stories don't match anybody else's stories. There's people that were here. There's people that were there. And everything he says seemed to contradict everything, man. You know what I mean? David Watson is a douche, man. And I, also, that's, I, I said that. Okay? <laughs> all right? Anyway, I don't believe him. I think it's bullshit. You know, because I've seen a lot of types, man. You know? I, I know what a Colombian does. I know what ties do. You know, I've worked almost every damn tie. Yeah. So, like, to confirm, do you think, like, it always was sweet? Like, there was never this RKS prior to the sweet skunk? It, 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 it had nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it at all. Skunk, none of that. It was It's just bullshit. If he got a hold of it and bred that out of it, he had nothing to do with it. Yeah, I guess I still see where you're coming from. Yeah, even if he did make the sweet from the rotten, he it's sort of by itself saying he didn't make the rotten. It was just a, another claim to fame, you know. People want to just jump on top, jump on a bandwagon, and be the one and the only to have the one and the only whatever it is, you know. Either you have it or you don't, you know. And it it's a pig with lipstick, or it's the real thing, man, you know. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'd be interested to to hear your thoughts on. I mean, you you sort of just touched on Sam and mentioned you're 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 not a fan. I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on Neville because he's someone who more recently we've been hearing thoughts about. Well, I respect Neville. Yeah, I respect Neville. Hell yeah, because he was actually a breeder. He bred dogs before he bred cannabis, so that gives him authenticity. Okay, he's not some dude that just woke up one day, oh, dude, I'm going to be a breeder and open a seed company. You know, Cat had an idea and Cat did it. You know, he, he's not the father of modern breeding for no reason at all. Yeah. He really was a breeder, you know. So he knew what he was looking for. They say Neville had the eye. You know what I mean? When, you, when they say he, he's got the eye, if you got the eye, you got the eye. You know what you're looking for. You see it. You know, it's they're they're smiling compared to the ones over here that are frowning. You know, you you know when you see it. So Neville had the eye. You know, so he was really good at making selections, like like I am, or like a lot of other breeders are too. You know, they see it. They see the hybrid potential. They see the the vigor. They know what they're looking for. You know, and he knew what he was looking for. And yeah, he, he he took it to the top, didn't he? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I certainly regard him like yourself as the, the father of modern breeding. I guess I'd be interested to ask. <laughs> uh, some guests in the past have mentioned that 
through having known him more closely on a personal level or maybe friends of that he might be one of those people where you need to do a little bit of separating of the uh, the art and the artist, so to speak. Have you ever heard anything like that? Like, you know, he's a great breeder, but maybe there was some character flaws. Any thoughts on that at all? Well, I talk to his best friend every day, you know, and he's online now because he just resurfaced out of the word work from being, you know, these guys were persecuted internationally. They'd had, they were sought after for a long time by, you know, and um, so people just get tired of it. They get tired of hiding. They get tired of seeing all this bullshit and they want to pop out of the woodwork and say, hey, no, that didn't happen. So before Neville died, he said, he told Dwight, find me because I'm doing what he was doing. I'm doing what Neville was doing. I'm, I'm focusing on, on breeding, not magazine culture, you know? I'm not, I'm not, my head isn't in magazine culture and capitalism and, and trying to be the next big thing. My head's in breeding and the fascination that lies in that, you know? So anyway, when I posted my back cross of the Neville uh, NL5 by the 88, NL5 Hayes, Neville saw it and he's like, ooh, that's it right there. And, the, and before he died, he pointed Dwight in my direction and we got in contact with each other. And so we've been communicating each other and sharing projects and doing things with Neville's last works, you know, like the Outback Hayes and Neville's Kush and a couple other things, you know. Um, wow. Would, would I be able to pull you up for a quick second and ask you about some of those varieties? Because I had seen the Outback Hayes mentioned, never heard of Neville's Kush. I'd love to hear a little more. Well, here's the thing about the Neville's Kush is we don't know what the lineage is. It's because... Neville was really sick at the time and he didn't want to bug him, you know, Hey man, what's this? You know? So we don't know, but Neville wanted to cush because that's what everybody was doing in the game. So he said, Hey, I want to make one too. So he did. And yeah, Dwight has those. And yeah, he's, he's in with the family. The, the Neville family is, is, uh, is, is, I, I can't talk about it too much, okay? I can just say that, that things are happening. That's all. Just just for clarification, say, are we talking about like his extended friends or like his literal family are sort of doing stuff with his... Literal family, family and friends. Ah, that that's exciting. You know? he, he had a son, you know, and he's interested. <laughs> wow, that that would be cool. I know that just out of like, you know, being Australian, I, I tried to sort of track him down many, many years ago and it was very hard, but I had always hoped that some news like this would sort of come out of the woodworks. Oh, there's a lot going on, man, but I can't talk about it. You know, it's not my position. But if you interview Dwight, you should, he, might, he might talk about some of that. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't overstep my boundaries and... and, and just, you know, give that information out. Sure. Yeah. You know, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's alive. Wow. That's, that's really exciting. And, and just to loop back before we move on, the Outback Haze, it, it, I think it's one that people are still sort of learning about. It's not super well known. Are you able to tell us anything at all about that in terms of maybe the genetics or what it's similar to at least? Well, you know, it says it's 2133 and, and Hampy's tie. You know, whatever tie that was, we don't know. But you look at Thailand and you look at the types in Thailand and for thousands of years, it was, it was the squirrel tail type, you know, that was held by kings and distributed throughout the, the regions by the people that held that type. And that's that's the Isan province type, the Thai stick, those types. But there were other types, of course, that were, you know, like the red tie, the blue tie, the blah, 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 blah tie, the chocolate tie, you know, these were developed for export, you know, not, not the red, but the chocolate and the, and the tie stick. That was all, that was all export. Those were export crops, but they were based off of the squirrel tail variety. And there's like three or four or five different phenotypes of this squirrel tail tie. And I think that's probably what it is. It's a, it's a squirrel tail variety. And Neville liked it, you know, so he used it. So he put it in there. And there's probably a tie in the haze, so it, it mashes up great, you know? 
Wow, and I'm I'm feeling a, a bit out of my depth right now. You you said I think you said twenty one cross thirty three. Sorry, what were those cultivars? That was his haze. Ah, yeah, like the numbered cutting. There's photographs of if you look, I can find photographs of them, and they look nice. You know, they're like, wow, that's a nice looking haze, man. Yeah, wow, nice. I, for some reason, I thought when you said the twenty one, I was like, is he talking about Mullum Madness? Because I think there's a famous twenty one cutting of Mullum or something. Yeah, I grew those. The flowering time was too long. And what Neville sent D- sent Dwight the, his branch of the Outback. He also gave it to other people, connoisseur, you know, uh, and a couple other guys. But they, they have different lines or different branches of the work. So each one of these guys that have a different branch of this Outback work have different you know, they've put their own selections on it in their own IBL Elling of it and have made it what it is in their own selections. So Dwight's is different than con- connoisseurs and, and it's different than whatever, whoever else has it in San Francisco. And, you know, so the phenotypic variations are going to vary be- depending on what breeder gets it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So I've already, you know, like, like how I got a hold of the NL2, the R2, you know. My selections were different than, than Dwight's selections. So right there, our line goes in two directions. You know? So if I keep going down my, my path, my, mine is going to be totally different than his in, in three or four generations, even though it's a 30-year IBL. And how would you describe your NL2? I've been lucky enough to try uh, Bodhi's Thin Leaf NL2, but I've never tried the more indica-leaning phenotypes. What's your thoughts on the line in general? This is the, uh, I got this line from, from Dwight. It's the, uh, the R2. It's, it's popular up in Northern Ontario. It's a 30-year IBL of the NL2 that they did outdoors. They had privacy and they had a lot of space and they had a lot of room to do a lot of selection. So they really did a good job on selecting for phenotypes that finished early with a nice cush profile, you know, um, they're fast and they're resinous and they withstand the cold pretty great. Um, R2 means Ron had two seeds, whoever Ron is. That's a great name. And, and there's rumor that there's skunk one in it, but we don't know, you know, it, it looks like NL2. It behaves like an NL2, you know, cushy. Because that's what NL2 is. It's NL1 by Neville's Cush. Ah, and, and do you see any real sativa in there at all or no? Very, very little. Just enough to make it interesting, you know, how most Afghan dominant types are with that one sativa in it. You know? Yeah, I, I think that was largely the sentiment Bodhi echoed when I was talking to him. He was like, oh, you know, th- this was just one plan out of God knows how many that had a little bit of a thinner leaf and uh, just melted your face the high. It was lovely stuff. Oh, I like it. It's great. I smoked the hell out of it. It reminds me of a, a good Williams Wonder, you know, nice, rounded, nice, warm, huggy kind of thing, you know. Man, I love that you just said that. Williams Wonder is one of my super nostalgic strains I love, and not enough people have had experience with it, I feel like. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one, huh? Nice and huggy. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it was right? like the first weed I ever tried where I was like, oh, this is kind of like mango-y passion fruit, like getting towards that passion fruit side of things. At least the sample I tried was. It's the ruderalis in it that, that, that gives it that unique kind of uh, astringent bitter thing that it has you know what i mean on top of the sweet that the the afghani has and do you know anything about it like i think there's some rumors that it was created in oregon somewhere between williams and wonder but i've always wondered is do you think there's any truth to that i used to think that too and that's what that was the rumor right but it was bred by some guy in indiana and and his name wasn't even william (laughs) (laughs) do you think like that was the case for a lot of the sssc crosses I don't know. You know, when those guys sourced that stuff back then, they were getting what they could get, you know. Ooh, this is good. Let's get it, you know. Oregon, Afghani. What the hell was that? You know, Kandahar, probably. You know, who knows? But back then, it was mostly imports or what heads had gone and collected from their travels abroad, you know. What I want to know is who sent Mel Frank the nine seeds of Afghani number one from Kabul, Afghanistan in 1979. 
Was that was that was that Watson? Who did that? Yeah, that's that's actually a really good question because I always ask people who are a bit older, like, do you remember distinctly the first time you saw Afghans rolling into California, for example? Oh, the front group brought them in, man. They they brought them in in '69. They were going to Afghanistan and getting the hash. They were, the, Hawaii was loaded with hash that the Brotherhood brought there, man. It was all Kandahar, you know? It was the Kandahars. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And, I mean, you, you may not have a definitive answer to this, but do you have any guesses as to what uh, Steve Murphy's Pura Syndica might have been? Mazar or, or just one of those region, you know, it's rumored to be a Mazar. It looks like a Mazar. But it could be a Kabul. It could be anything within that region, a Balk, anything, a Shebergen, and who knows? You know, we, we had little knowledge of these things back then. We just knew Afghanistan. You know, it was only the Brotherhood and people that kept record of this stuff that came back and said, yeah, we got this from Gandahar. You know, I think a lot of people looking at the Pura Syndica would be quite impressed it's it's a very pretty looking plant in, in a lot of ways it sort of reminds me of deep chunk do you feel like it's one of the better expressions of afghani or like there's actually a lot that's better it's just less known no it's the western world's used to one thing man and that's the combination of a mazar and a hindu in one package it's simply because of the introduction of the northern lights combination of the hindu and the in the mazar so people this this americanized thought process They love that outboard exhaust smell on Labor Day. You know what I mean? That that greasy, sweet, tiny, you know, they're just used to it. So that's what all through the 80s is what Americans palate was used to. So as we bred with these types into the early 90s, that's what everybody got. That's what everything is now. It's all all Mazar Hindu effect. So unless you really go to the, the specific regions and get those specific Afghanis, you're not going to know what this is all about. Each one of these hash plants, you know, these families kept these things for hundreds of years in their family or their tribe or whatever. So they have a, a unique special product that's like unique and special and like food grade, super valuable. You know what I mean? And it was only war and stuff like that that started disrupting that that you know, that heritage. So like, like I said, I've grown a lot of Afghanistans. I've, pr- I've probably grown maybe 10 different land race Afghanis. And we're talking, you know, up to 40 plants every run outdoors. So I'm looking at the traits of all these, these Afghanis and none of them have that, that modern indoor perfect cola thing going on. But all of them have a higher kind of resin quality, a higher terpene value, a higher, you know, you, you really, your eyes really light up when you, when you put your senses on, it. you know, like the ball cash, for example, that's like one of the best caches in the world, man. Smiley, giddy, happy, just boom. Yes. You know, <laughs> like if, if all herb could smoke like that, everybody'd be happy, you know? <laughs> Wow, you've uh, you got me thinking. I think I might have some bulk seeds stashed away. Maybe I need to get on to them. It's interesting, man. You know, it, it would be really cool to, to do an indoor run of something like that and, you know, maybe hybridize it to a modern type and see what you can, what you can do. That's a popular thing now, you know, and I don't know if I'm the cause of that because that was, that's what I started doing so long ago. And then another guy started doing it, another guy started doing it. You know, back then it was me, Snow High, but I, it's just a couple guys doing it. Now, now we got 500 seed, 999 seed banks, and they're all like, ah, trying to be the next big thing, you know? It's just funny. Yeah, certainly. And you know what? You just touched on a question I wanted to bring up, which was sort of ties into both when you were talking about Neville and he had the eye, as well as what you just mentioned about the types of crosses you do. I noticed both in Neville's work and with your own that possibly from my perspective one of the sort of key components that seems to have a good chance of success is doing those raw f1s you know you mentioned earlier that hybrid vigor you know you really can't replicate it do you think that's one of the keys there's a method to my madness and it's not magazine breeding culture okay 
I have an agricultural background. I went to college for this stuff, you know, before I was listened to the advice of ask Ed, you know what I'm talking about? But so when I popped out of college, I had an edu- I had an agricultural background when I first started growing cannabis, you know, on my own as an adult out of school. And so I, I approached it at, on that level. The way I cloned, the way I did everything was different than this magazine paradigm, which seemed to be geared towards product sales and selling mark gimmicky this and that. And the way they taught us to do this in agri- and in the agriculture sense, it was so much more simpler and basic and, and, and right. You know, it was really the, the magazine, the myths that turned, turned me off about all that because it's just bullshit. You know, you don't need none of that shit. Yeah, look, it's interesting that you you bring that up because I did want to talk about that. And a thought I've been having more recently, I think it's pretty edgy, a bit controversial, is that I'm starting to think maybe High Times was like equally as damaging for the scene as it was beneficial. It's, It's true, but, you know, it's like don't shoot the messenger. They gave us a lot during the 70s. They gave us a lot during the 80s. But somewhere in the like 90s, it started to fall off into, into glossy marketing, gimmicky shit. You know, in the 70s, they were, they were thick, fat, informative magazines. You know, I remember sitting around reading these things as a kid with my, my parents got, would, would buy them. You know, so they're always around. I've read every damn high times there ever was. You know, I've watched the magazine deteriorate into what it is today, is, is what you might say. But yeah, you're right. It did, in a way, lead to a lot of misinformation and, and targeting a lot of 18 to 25-year-old males to buy just junk, you know? Yeah, that, that junk comment you make really hammers home because I think at a certain point you see that, you know, pay for play advertising and awards and articles start to creep into the magazine and for a long time i thought you know whoever was the editor-in-chief sort of dropped the ball a bit by you know we're going to do a big strain write-up about this company's blueberry and it's like what like that's just some random paid advertisement more or less and you start seeing it what it is man you know you start seeing it for what it is you see right through it yeah, I, I thought it's interesting and I thought even more funny was that, you know, a few years ago, High Times sold and like Danny Danko and all those people working for it moved on and now they've started a new magazine and everyone was like sort of keen to support it and I was like, but hang on, wasn't Danny Danko the editor-in-chief who allowed all this sort of faux advertising to occur? That's funny you say that. Danny Danko did a Living Organic Soil article and basically plagiarized all of her information and didn't give us any credit, you know. Because we're the ones, we're, I'm the pre- pro- proprietor of living organic soil. We just dropped the soil thing in favor of the seed thing because that really wasn't going anywhere. You know, you can teach a man to fish. Guess what? He fishes for the rest of his life. So that's what we were doing. We weren't making any money off that and we couldn't sustain that. So we ta- taught a man to fish a thousand times for free. You know, the information's out there. You can go and get it. You don't need nothing, man. You're, which, the, the secret to all of this is increasing your negative ionic surface area in your soil. That's it, man. Wow, yeah, okay. And do you think that's why, without people understanding exactly what you're saying, they sort of have this propensity to want to increase your cationic exchange capacity? Well, as Americans and capitalists and marketing victims, they're, they're, you know, they want instant gratification because they're Americans. They, they, they want to spray the bug and the bug needs to die now. Shh. You know, so when they apply these fertilizers, they want to see magic. They want to see, oh, just like in the picture. If I put more on, it'll get bigger, more, more, you know. The plant craves electrolytes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, bro. Okay, so that's what's going on. And it's it's a big scale. And there's a lot of money to be made, millions of dollars, you know. And now Monsanto has their hands in this. They own General Hydroponics, blah, 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 miracle Grow, blah, 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 blah. They're not going to take their dirty fucking hands out of that scene. They're going to they're gonna keep marketing. They're going to keep pushing their fucking poison on us, you know. So, you know, like I said, my information's free. You can get online. You can go find it. You know, the soil recipes, all of that, everything. 
tell you how to do everything for free. What's trippy about it all is, is the, the seed company idea, because anybody can do this. So that's, that's what's happening. Anybody is doing this. So it creates a lot of confusion. It creates a lot of, you know, I don't even know what this stuff is anymore nowadays. I, I totally disregard it and excuse it as bullshit. I don't even pay attention. Wedding cake, whatever. Cookies, what? <laughs> nope. Not doing it. Never. I haven't even bought weed out of a dispensary, man. You know, I smoke black Colombians and Panamas and just come on. You know, it's it's. <laughs> so I guess I don't need to ask you what your favorite Girl Scout cutting is. I just don't know. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I mean, so let's tap into that then, because I'd love to ask you, you know, out of those cool, funky, you know, black Colombian, cool stuff like that, what's a variety that you think isn't particularly well known, but everyone would like love the shit out of it? Oh, well, you know, anybody that smokes a black Colombian would just love it. Or a Jamaican or a nice African or a good Thai. You know, one or two pulls off this shit's all you need, man. And you're so see ya. Go go do a task, bro. You know, that's that's awesome. And I, I'd love to touch on the Colombian a little more because I think as time's gone by, I've started to realize that when I first got into genetics, so to speak, I maybe put a bit of overemphasis on Thai and especially with the reemergence of like the the black Colombian haze, things like that. I think I'm starting to learn more from people that like Colombian might be the unsung hero in a lot of different things. What's your thoughts? I think you're right, man. I think it's 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 um overlooked a lot. It's quite potent, it's quite has a nice effect. It's it's your eyes, man, they just boom, you know, you're baked. You're stoned. You know, there's there's CBD in there. You know, you're you're on the couch. It, you, you think, oh, I'm gonna smoke this Colombian sativa and I'm gonna just get all this energy. It don't really work that way, man. You know, I, I had a col I smoked some black Colombian with a friend of mine who, who grows a bunch of polys, wedding cake this, cookies that, and all this. One hit, dude was on the floor. One hit of some ropey ass looking black Colombian. Okay. And that's that says it all, you know. And do you feel like, you know, a lot of the consumers out there, for example, who might say, oh, you know, cookies is all that really does it for me. Do you think like they just don't have the exposure to really make that claim? Yeah, they don't. They're just they're just lost in that world of capitalism. And, you know, they don't. Maybe they're not thinking enough. Maybe they're just complacent in their lives with their device and their programming and everything that they do in their life. And they just don't care. You know, but I mean, look at somebody like me who's passionate about cannabis and everything and has done it his whole life compared to somebody who just wants to smoke a smoke a whatever and get stoned. What does he care about cookies or whatever? You know what I mean? And there's a lot of that. A lot of kids. Younger, younger. people. Yeah, look, I think it's actually probably one of the more pertinent questions that's been in my mind for a while now, which sort of if I gist it out, it's like. Is the onus on us as the growers and breeders to try to educate the general consumer or like, like how do we let people know that like cookies is not the ultimate expression of cannabis? Well, I kind of do that, you know, I kind of, that's my, the, there's a method to my madness and that's introducing different types of cannabis to people from around the world, man, in different combinations. And in, in, in going back to what you were saying about uh, hetero, hybrid vigor. Now, there's a method to my madness with this, and I, I don't, I guess I'm going to say it. I, I'm, I'm working with heterosis breeding, okay? I'm following the heterosis pattern that when I take parents of unrelated genetic origin and I cross them together, I'm going, most likely, going to have a heterosis hybrid child. There's going to be parent, there's going to be kids that look like their mom, there's going to be kids that look like their dad, and there's going to be kids that have hybrid vigor because these are unrelated genetic parents that push everybody out of the way. <sighs> their flowers are bigger. There's more resin. They're faster. They're, they're everything. So that's kind of what I focus on is because I want people to experience the heterosis value of the F1 and they get it. Finally, they see it. Finally, they're getting it. Finally, dude buys a pack of seeds, cracks them open, Finds this plant, goes, oh my God. 
you know, over and over again. It doesn't matter what, what happens online because that's all bullshit. That dude's life just changed. You know, he told me in an email. And it, it's, it's year after year, man. You know? Yeah, you know, you just made me think back myself. When was the last time I grew a True F1 hybrid? And I thought, it's probably a while ago. And so then I thought, you're right. There's probably a lot of people out there who have never grown a True F1. And they, they do have that sort of, you uh, yeah, like revelation moment. Yep. And that's what it is, man. Um, and the chance exists that you're not going to find that heterosis vigor in some of these, these outcrossings. But the reality is, is it works 95% of the time, man. So out of a pack of 15 seeds, cat's going to get five individuals that exhibit heterosis traits, you know, sit like with a bulk. I did a bulk by a Sinai. They're monsters, man. Those are just, just colas of hash. You know, are branches of hash, you know, and that's what those plants were traditionally bred for. They were hash plants. They were bred to produce resin, not take centerfold pictures in high times. Sinai, it's not not a strain you hear about often. I have heard about it before and I thought, oh, Egyptian, that sounds sort of cool. Anything unique about that one from your perspective that maybe differentiates it a little bit? Well, just the fact that it's an ancient type and it was developed as a hash plant for thousands of years. You know, it's drought tolerant. Um, it's potent. You know, it has flavor. It's, it's, you could tell it was selected. You know, it was something that was kept by these people for a long time. It's pretty neat, actually. But you got to be a land race guy to appreciate this stuff. You got to be like, wow, man, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow a bunch of cyanides and like put, fill a jar with that, you know? You got to be one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly. Okay, so if anyone was listening and they're like, look, I'm keen to give it a go. I want to try a cool F1, maybe find some of this hybrid vigor you're talking about. What's something you offer that you think you'd be happy to sort of say, look, if you start with this, you probably find something good. You know, one of the things I always point to people to is, is a Mazar Sharif by the 76 Peace Corguero. And I've worked that line into, the, into an IBL over the last 10 years using siblings and back crosses and blah, 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 blah to, to get what I want out of it as, as a line. It, it's got a good meditative quality to it, okay? It's better than an OG. It's better than cookies. It's better than that. You're going to eat. You're going to sleep. You're going to be well. And, and you're, you know, this is weed you don't smoke for like two, three days in a row because you're going to have a hangover effect for two, three days in a row. You know, wow, that that's <laughs> you gnarly. Know? Well, you can look at the numbers on my page, and you can see the CBG in there, and you know, it's it's very odd that these 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 terp profiles are so different from all these modern polys. You know, because they are different. Period. They're, these these all these modern polys have the same genetics, unless these guys are outcrossing them to these land races. Mazar Hindu, Mazar Hindu, Mazar Hindu, derp, derp, you know. Out of curiosity, because it, it, does, it is like a bit of a focal point in discussions more recently, have you ever tried Mac 1? And if so, do you think the Colombian in that is a real Colombian? There's been some question marks around that from people. No, I haven't, but I have had smoked the uh, Cuban Black Haze, and I can tell you that is definitely NL5 Haze and probably Skunk 1. Ah, interesting. Okay, because I think, some people think it's just pure NL5 haze. Do you suspect some skunk? Here's my theory. Here's my theory. Here's what happened. Dude bought a pack of seeds from the catalog. He moved to Florida. Skunk got mold. He got a male, so he used it on his NL haze. And are there any specific skunk traits you see in the Cuban black haze? Yeah. The orange hairs, you know, the nose bite that SK1 has. You know, the, those traits that SK1 has that are identifiable in most of its outcrosses, you know, but it's definitely NL5 haze, no doubt about it. And um, you mentioned before the, the Peace Corps Guerrero. We had a, a listener who is a fan of yours ask if you could maybe talk a little bit about the Peace Corps Panama. Okay, here's what happened. I knew a guy one time who knew a lady who... During the 70s, all throughout the 70s, worked in South America and Mexico as a Peace Corps worker. She was heady. She was from California and she was a stoner. So she collected seeds from the weeds she bought 
in every freaking region she went to. When I got the package, there were over 30 types and stuff I couldn't even pronounce. You know, they were all stored. They were all stored improperly. Rolled up in little bindles and put in a film container, you know, kept in a box somewhere. So the only thing that we got up was the Panama, the Guerrero, and the Acuna. Okay. Now the Acuna was given to another grower and he got robbed and we lost it. So the Panama, we reproduced it, we reproduced the Guerrero, and we distributed it. Snow High got some of my Panama, and he calls it the 76, okay? It's, it, it, we don't know what the years were on the Panama, so I say 74 through 76. He says 76, I say 74. But they all, they all came through my hands first. Yeah, wow. And, and do you feel like they're quite unique compared to maybe some of the other Panamas we see, like from maybe Ace Seeds or Coastal Genetics? Oh, yeah, they're pure, man. They're just pure Panama. There's, there's no molestation about it. It's just a pure Panama red line. You know, everything that it ever was. Uh, it starts start them under 1212 in seed, you know. Big, long, red spears, lots of, lots of hairs, you know, one or two hits and you're blah, 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 blah you know. So I guess I'd be interested in asking you, some people think that the reason why haze is so good was because collectively it was better than the individual parts. But it sounds like you're really fond of each of the individual parts. Do you think that haze was much of an improvement on each of the components? Well, the thing is, is nobody really knows what haze is. Okay? We can only guess. And we, we what, what, we, what the top guys think me dwight and these other guys we're, we're tracing lineage and we're tracing history and we're, we're 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 tracing roots of import and all this other shit so it was most likely brotherhood imports okay whatever those guys brought in what you know here's a here's a hint in 1966 there was a movie called uh oh what was that it was a surfer movie um Mike Henson and the other dude that go around the world, it was called Endless Summer, okay? That was a Brotherhood of Eternal Love sponsored movie. It was actually a hash and seed scouting mission, okay? They used the movie as cover to go and do this in 1966. So they set up all these relations, seed, hash, and everything in 66. So they could come back. And this is where it helped Mike Henson got all these seeds and hash back. He started making the hauled surfboards because you could carry a surfboard on the plane and you could carry epoxy. So they could fill up these compartments with massive seed, massive hash, and just get right on the plane, man. Yeah, so by 1971, they told me, okay, by 1971, all the genetics in the world that they knew of were in Laguna Beach. And do you think like there's this treasure trove of genetics sitting somewhere waiting to be cracked open or it all got dispersed? There's brotherhood guys I know that won't come off their shit, you know, and like I could have had a chance, but not anymore. You know, it's just that way. These guys are never going to come off their shit. They're going to die with it or they're going to give it away when they're de- when they're dying. You know, that's how I got the one and the blue orca off coot. You know what I mean? And we were on good terms the whole freaking time, man. Just one day I'd show up at his house and he don't even know who the fuck I am. Dude had a heart attack. Okay. Forgot everybody and everything. Got addicted to fucking opiates. Forgot who the fuck I was. Forgot he even gave me the one. And just, you know, just forgot us. Forgot that we had kids, you know, we'd come there with our kids and sit on his couch and eat dinner and all this other fucking shit. You know, yeah, it's, it was, it was kind of disheartening. You know, but I've seen that before where a guy has a heart attack and he forgets his own fucking kid, you know. So whatever, whatever, all this shit that Coot said, it's just crap. You know, we never really said anything about it. He said he only said one thing to me. He said, well, you got the genetics now, so you're, you're set. And I said, yeah, I know, man. He says, but we got to do something for you. We got to, you know, he says, just just make a donation in my kid's name. His kid got run over by a, a drunk driver in the early 70s, and he went out and beat the shit out of the guy and went to prison for it. 
So we did that. We made a donation in his kid's name, and we still got all that shit. You know, food bank or whatever that we're doing for, for, for what he gave us. You know, because I've always been fair. I don't steal shit from people or none of that. This game's pretty uh, cutthroat and dirty, man. Some scallywags out here. I mean, it's good you brought that up because we did have a, a viewer submit a question about that. And I guess you sort of answered some of it, but they were sort of wondering, is there an alternative cutting of like the one, like a sort of a fake one, or is it just the one real one and that's the one you have? Yes. People that Coot didn't trust and people that I didn't trust who we thought that were going to fuck us, that were going to go out and just automatically start a seed company. We didn't give them the cut. We gave them the one by Blue Moon Rocks, Backcross 2 or Backcross 1. And they looked almost the same. You know? And sure as shit, man, those guys take off and boom! That's what they did. So guess what? Now we can illegitimize you. You know, if you if you think that you're going to like just blow smoke up somebody's ass to come steal a cut and you're not going to get found out in the process. <laughs> come on, man. And yeah, there's been people that I've worked with that have stolen the cut, blue orca from me, have stolen the one from me. There is the one and there is the blue orca out there. I can't tell you who or where or whatever, but it's floating around. And, but they're hard to keep. The cuts are hard to keep. So good luck. And the reason I like them so much is because they're authentic, old brotherhood, Thai, and an Afghani combination. I love Afghanis and Thais, man. That's my favorite. You know? <laughs> that sounds amazing. I would love to ask you, because it's actually really hard to find this sort of information. What are, on In terms of the one, what are like the terps like? What's the flavor? What's the effect? Oh, man. It's just, it's just really strong. You know, all these, these cake cookie growers man once they get a hold of that they're like fuck that man this is all i want to smoke this is all i want to grow and that's what they tell me it's the truth because that's all you have in your jar that fucking works you know after you smoked everything in the universe there's the one sitting there in the jar you know it's one of those ones where you're like it'll wreck your day so you know you don't just jump into that now blue Earth, on the other hand that's that's like a williams wonder or a Something like that. That's something women can smoke. It's going to make you feel good. It's going to, you know, it's going to make you feel warm and huggy and smiley and have a good appetite and sleep well, you know, because Blue Orca finishes at 56 days and the one finishes at 80. So if anybody out there thinks that they have the one, better check that at 80 days, bro. You know what I mean? Okay, that's interesting to hear. And, and one of our listeners specifically was interested in picking up a, a cross from you of the one to something. They said, which cross would you recommend and which of the crosses do you think like you're best going to get like a dominant, the one sort of expression? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing now is I'm trying to put that package into seed form. So I've done all these various, I did an outcrossing to the Black Kandahar to get the one and the Blue Orca together in one package. So I've been working those lines and working for the traits to get into a seed line that's, that represents everything that I expect out of it. And if, if it's not going to work, I'm not going to do it. So I'm pretty far into it right now. And, you know, that might be done pretty soon, maybe this year. But as far as like what somebody can buy, it's the one by Blue Moon Rocks, the Backcross 2, 3, 4, if it's cubed. You know, yeah, I had seen that one online, and I wanted to ask you: Was there anything specific about the Blue Moon Rocks that you thought made it like a, a well-suited partner to the one? Well, when I was uh, growing herb in the '90s, I went to Canada and I bought Bubbleberry, um, Bubblegum, and Shiskaberry off Mark Emery in like 1993 or some shit. And they were $200 a pack, dude, for 10 seeds. And I grew them all, you know, and I, I found a nice bubble gum and I found a nice bubble berry. And I, it wasn't really, the chisca berry didn't do it, you know. But I kept that one cut of that, that bubble berry and, and, you know, made a million dollars, you know, because it was the best thing anybody had ever seen. It was the original DJ Blueberry by the Indiana Bubble Gum. 
you know, Sager Mathis bubblegum. It was a DJ Sager Mathis collaboration and they made the bubbleberry and won the cups or whatever with it. So we're like, yeah, this is it. Boom. You know, and then I got cracked, thrown to prison, all that other shit. And I got out of prison. The first thing I want to do is go find bubbleberry again. Well, that's gone. But now we have OG Kush. I'm like, what? So I go to Humboldt. Buddy's down there and they hook me up with these, these cuts and I bring them back up to the to back up to Olympia and I grow them. And I'm like, what the fuck? What is this? This is what people want. Big spindly, tall, falling all over themselves, mold and tiny little popcorn buds, but they smell good. You know, get you stoned. And then I started looking for bubbleberry started looking and looking and then i found out that bog had crossed an old dj blueberry to blue moon and then to his boggle bubble gum which is a good bubble gum you know so i thought ooh, ooh, this is going to be good you know and i got him and bought the pack and yeah there was some good phenotypes in there but there's also some fucking hay man you know same, same thing with everything, though. People think, oh, man, yeah, I got this and did, did through a nanner, you know. <sighs> and and my, from my experience, all this intersex shit comes from poor breeding, okay, from my predecessors, not me. It's their fucking lines that they fucked up on, you know, because I won't, I won't use that shit, man. I guess an interesting sort of... Uh, counterpoint maybe just to be devil's advocate slightly is uh, I can't remember who it was but someone who deals with a lot of land race work it might have even been Lewis from AC said that um, if you do truly want to work with a land race line there is a bunch of Hermes stuff you got to weed through would you agree that there is some land races that do have sort of Hermes and it's not all horrible breeding per se absolutely you know uh the Laos, for example, um, absolutely riddled with it. The cashmere, absolutely riddled with it. Um, things like that, you know, that are off in these really weird regions of the globe that they don't really give a shit about intersex. You know, they use it as hash plants, you know. So when you go up, you, get, you, you start pulling this stuff out of the woodwork and think that you're going to breed with it. You better think again, man. You better, you better look at it real good, you know. Yeah, definitely. But, but then again, there's a lot of land races and a lot of narrow leaf drug cultivars. And we're talking as far north into Kazakhstan, 50 degrees north that have no intersex that that are just nice plants, you know? Yeah, that's true. I guess it also is a reflection of the, the thousands of years of caretaking and whatnot. But uh, just to jump to another question that a, a listener had submitted that I think you'll be able to answer for them is they said, oh, you know, unfortunately, I'm sort of limited to growing in a tent. Do you have any offerings that you think would do well in a tent or just a small space in general? Yeah, I, w I would do like, uh, you know, if somebody came to me and said, hey, this is what I need, I would, I would give them what they need, you know, like a blue orca cross or, or something that I know stays squat and compact and that, that they can manage. The, the short flowering time, you know, what they want. Yeah, nice, nice. You know, where myself is like, eh, I'll grow anything, you know. No, no roof limit. Yeah, pretty much, you know. And I just don't grow inside. I don't, I don't grow inside anymore, man. It's all, it's all in, in greenhouses, light up, you know, because I can control the flowering and, and height and everything, and I can see the full range of expressions and and do whatever what I need to. Do you think that commercially produced cannabis, like you know, for the masses, so to speak, will eventually transition to being sort of all greenhouse slash outdoor? I don't know. You know, I just don't know. The, the industry is really a mystery to me right now. It just seems that they're, that marketing's over the top, man. CBD toothpicks, CBD socks, you know, CBD cars for your tire. I mean, cars, tires for your car, you know. It's just a joke, man. So it's going to spill over into the legitimate, legitimacy of it. You know, all this gimmicky shit. So it's, it's, it's going to climax, it's going to boil over, and then it's going to settle. So whenever this, the settling is when it goes federally legal, that's going to be, that's it. And that's kind of what I'm waiting for too, because that puts legitimacy, that puts legitimacy to what I'm doing. I can now go and patent my types. 
Nobody can patent a type. You can't do that. Don't believe anybody. It's bullshit. Only Monsanto can. <laughs> okay. The Wild West. Not until it's federal. And, and we're talking, you're going to be shelling out, you know, a thousand, two thousand bucks for this patent. And, and you're going to be waiting six months, seven months, 12 months for an answer. And it's going to come back as a, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not a patent, but uh, in the process of being a patent. Oh, yeah. For the next five years, you know, so you got five guys pat- trying to patent the same type and you're hoping that, oh, am I going to be the one to do it? So that's what it's going to be. And if I don't patent my types, guess what? It's up for grabs, man. You know, everybody's type is up for grabs until the patent is on. You know, I could go steal cookies if I wanted to, you know, there's no patent on it. Yeah, wow, that'll that'll be an interesting day for sure. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna level the playing field, man, and it's gonna really get rid of the noise. I'd be curious to to know what strain, like in your opinion, most emulates a coffee. Hmm, good question, man. It's gonna be South Americans. You know, here's a here's a something that. Well, I guess the Western world doesn't know much about is that the indigenous people tend to select for their culinary traits. So a lot of South American types echo their culinary, their culinary, you know, spicy, cilantro, chocolate, coffee, all that stuff, you know, peppers. You go to Africa, what happens there? They start, it starts imitating their, cul- their what they eat, you know? That's one thing I've noticed. Yeah, that's cool. I'm going to have to give that a go. A nice, nice Mexican or something. Um, I would say, yeah, man, a Mexican or um, a Colombian or, a, or even a Oaxacan would give you a nice, probably a, a good coffee, you know? And Oaxacans, yeah, man, I, I'm just, I, I might say that Oaxacan's probably my favorite. It's just, it's just, man, wow. You know, pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really neat. Is it one of those ones where like it's a nice balance of different sort of things or it's just it's a it's a feel well type. You know, it's a, a well being type where you smoke it and you just shit's okay, man. You know? It's just something you can work on, something you can play on, something something you can do anything on and not be too out of your mind. You know? Like, say, a Vietnam would do to you. Certainly. And as was, speaking of Hayes origins, we suspect it's Vietnam making the noise in there. Because I'll, I'll say it, there's nothing stronger than a good Vietnam, man. They're just... You know, <laughs> I'm r- really out. glad to hear you say that because I... Uh... I think that one of the most memorable equatorial land races I've ever had. I've had some really nice ties through Bodhi, but um, he he let me try one of his Vietnamese one time, and that's forever held the the spot in my mind as like most memorable sort of weed I ever smoked. It's it's very haze like, you know, and these properties that haze has, they're they're reminiscent if you're if you're a smoker of all these land races. So what these things that I identify and these other guys identify, Vietnam, uh. Colombian, uh, Oaxacan, uh, Thai. These are, these are, there's notes in there. You know, it's like when you, when you're playing in a band, you, you, you know what that note is, you know, that they're, they're playing a G man, you know, it's like that. It's like, you can, you can, you can, you can tear it apart with your mind, you know? But anyway, get a hold of these Viet. Get a just watch what happens next, okay? Dwight and me, we're 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 working on this Vietnam haze trip thing, okay? <laughs> that's that's awesome. I'd love to see that happen. Oh, I got some good Vietnam crosses. I did cross um uh, uh that um vietnamese provincial park land race to the black colombian and that's probably pretty haze like man you know if you're a haze guy that'd probably be one to get and check out and go through a pack of those you know 
Wow, I'm, I might need to do that. What sort of flower tomes do you think might sort of be in the ballpark? They're long, man. Now, the Black Columbian isn't as long as people would think. We're talking, you know, 70 days, but it will go over 100 if you have the phenotype it does. Now, my selecting, when I do this stuff, I'm doing it in a, in a light depth hoop, and I'm looking for stuff that finishes early because I know what you guys want. You don't want that, oh, 2 million day whatever when we could have the same package in 80 days, you know? And yeah, I'm not overlooking that we may lose something in later flower times either. You know, I'm still paying attention to that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I wanted to ask you because for the longest time, I had always seen this most beautiful picture. I think it's of your chocolate tie. How, how did you get it? Like, like with those really swollen bracts and the purple look? I think it's an outdoor photo from memory. It might even be... I think it might be Darwall's chocolate tie. I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 that line, but one of them's from Snow High and one of them's from uh, Herbie. Okay, Herbie did a back cross, and he wasn't he wasn't supposed to, but he did it anyway. And I got to hold the pack of the seeds, so I I put that to the to the Snow High and worked it out into what I remember buying chocolate tie. You know. The traits I remember, the smells, the look, the, you know, what the flower looked like and everything. So that's what I was doing. So after a couple, you know, a couple runs of that, that was pretty easy because that line's pretty much an IBL anyway. You know, I just put my hand on it, you know? Yeah, wow. I mean, I think one of the things which always caught me about it was that it looked so modern for a strain that obviously was old world. Well, you got Snow High working it, you got... Howard, which is Darrow spelt backwards, working it. Okay. And you got Herbie working it. You got me working it. You got three, four breeders on the thing. And we're not just dumbasses. We're breeders, you know? <laughs> you know, we, 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 we're looking for stuff. We're looking for traits and, and everything. So if it's going to have, after that, yeah, it's going to have a modern, you know, cola, nice looking flower kind of trip. But they're still radial ties, you know. Reminds me of, um, what do they say? It take, takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> it, it, that's one of those things, man, really. And that's the result. You know, you're looking at it right there in that, in that photograph, you know. Um, that's awesome. Look, we touched on it a bit earlier, but I'd love to come back. I am a passionate organic grower myself. I would love to hear a little bit about your grow style. Obviously, you mentioned it's organic. What are some of the general things you think are important to focus on in your organic grow? Well, it's just soil food web gardening. You know, we work with the soil food web, not against it. Microbes, um, funguses. Uh, there's so many things that we utilize that enhance this experience on a natural level, man, that just takes this to a different place, you know, and we've educated people on all of this, you know, I'm the first guy to use aloe. Okay. And post it. I'm the, you know, all of this stuff. You did, we hammered it out on icy mag 10 years ago. It's all hammered out there and the mess is still there, but they've, you know, they've gone in there. We got banned and all this other shit. And, you know, what happened was, we had a big group on icy mag and we were, you know, my thread was leading the fucking charge on icy mag every day. Biggest thread ever, you know, biggest thread ever, biggest fucking this and that ever, whatever, you know, but it was just good fun for us. And we were teaching people and learning and doing all this other shit. And um, we just busted everything open and everybody came together at once and really took it to the next level. You know, everything, enzymes, microbes, fungus, fertilizers, ionic reactions, everything, you know? And so we put all that information in one package and yeah, and I'm not going to just tell everybody it anymore. You're going to have to pay for it because I don't want to do that anymore, you know? But you're working with the soil food web. And one of the main things that makes this all work is the fact that you have to increase negative ionic surface area in your soil. Yeah, you have to. There's only one in the, all this hydroponic shit. They're cheating. They're cheating the system by tricking the system with, a, with, with ions and anions. Okay. It's a trick. So that's why the weed shit. But if we can 
increase negative ionic surface area. And now how we do this is we add those things into the soil, compost, the humic material, okay? Earthworm castings, humic material, um, anything that has that, that, that value, like basalt rock dust, for example, has a paramagnetic uh, negative charge on it and it's igneous rock. It's every freaking mineral known to man. It's immediately uptakeable and you'll burn your plants with it if you don't follow the directions, okay? Now, there we go again. We've just increased in our negative ionic, you know, everything. So you're getting more calcium, you're getting more magnesium. All the system works better if you have those negative attraction sites. And it, I could go into this in more detail in, in another time, but what I can tell you right now is the way you can get this is through compost, earthworm castings, and using those inert materials like, like char, for example. You know, char isn't humic material. It doesn't unfold to accept more ions. It's just a carbon-14 frame, which will hold ions, okay? The humic molecule, this is what's weird about it, actually unfolds to accept more. So it, it's just this weird mechanism that, like, that the whole earth runs on it. And you can look it up and read about it. Um, some of the better studies come out of Germany on it. Um, yeah, check it out, you know, check it out. That's, that's cool to hear. I mean, I, I guess I would be interested to ask you, are there any things which over the years you've realized are probably more important? I mean, I guess the obvious one is like in organics, watering, when you do it, how much, that's pretty important. Um, are there any other things which you think are like should really have attention paid to them or not so much? It's really just that, you know, once you change the negative ionic surface area in your soil, your whole game changes. Everything changes. So whatever food you use is going to have an effect. If I go and buy whatever at the grocery store, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. If I go and I get some horse shit, it's going to work too. You know, as long as that mechanism is there, as long as that attraction, as long as those attraction sites are functional, you know, as long as you have them in there. So when you see people with growing in cocoa cord, oh, how come my plants are, bleh? it's inert material. It doesn't even have a negative charge on it, man. What are you doing? You know, it's that simple, man. I noticed when I was reading through some of the old posts, I had seen that there was, at one point at least, there was some talk of you leaving IC Mag, starting your own forum. Is that something you ever want to pursue or not so much anymore? Well, we did. That's what happened. They banned us because they thought, they, they were spying on us in a private group in IC Mag. We had an advanced living soil uh, private page, you know, and we, there were mods in there and everything. And one of the mods narked us out to like skip or somebody, you know, these guys are, they're talking about going to the seed depot because they, they say we suck here. You know, this is when the seed depot opened up and whoever that, what was that guy's name? I don't know, but he ran off with everybody's money or something. But anyway, he, he opened up the seed depot and, 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 or whatever that, that forum was or whatever the hell that thing was called. And he made me a mod, made other people mod. And we had a big section there and that's, that's where we took over the forum again. But then that collapsed. He got busted doing something or ripping people off or some shit. And then we created our own website, which got really big, super big, massive members. Everybody knew about it, but it was private because we get sick of dealing with fucking dumbasses and trolls. You know, if you're going to come in here and start shit, you're out, man. You know, and, 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 and people did get banned because they would do that. They would argue and fight and, and just go against the progression of it. So, of course, you're getting fucking banned. So a lot of those problems reflect on me now because of the people we banned back then, you know, like Dank Frank and all those other disgruntled employee vibe people, you know, they, their butt hurt because they didn't get what they wanted out of it. They didn't get they didn't get my seeds. They didn't get this. They didn't get that. They didn't get to be a mod or they, you know, it's some kind of uh, entitlement issue, you know. And they were never even hired. This is all volunteer shit. 
Yeah, sure. I can see people often get very passionate and uh, involved in these sorts of things. I've got a bit of a longer question here to ask you, but it was one that sort of I was hoping to get around to, and this seems like a good point to jump into it. Basically, as I was sort of doing some research for our chat, um, I, I came across some posts of people who sort of said that their experiences with you were a little bit questionable. But then many of those same people would go on to put a post up and say, oh, you know, hey, guys, Gas contacted me. He's made everything all good. Um, and it made me sort of wonder, you know, was there maybe a specific time or incident where maybe orders weren't sort of going out as we might want or something which might explain why there was this hiccup? I'm, I'm confident that you're not a fraud and many of the, the posts go on to say that. But it appears some people did have blips, yeah. The posts are made by those very same people I was just talking about. And they're the repeat offenders, okay? They're the repeat guys. They got mad because I didn't let them release this or got mad because I didn't get them that. They're those guys. And they actively follow me around and troll my ass. They just do it, you know? That's what they do. But yeah, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. Okay, we've, we've worked with a lot of distributors and we're trying to find a, a distributor that we can rely on and get our shit out there when we need to, you know? It's been a hard game, man, because... 10 years of mailing fucking seeds, dude, at every fucking post office and every fucking place up here and getting busted and all these stupid asses filling out the wrong thing, getting us cracked, busting our shit in that post office. Oh, God, they fucked up that one. Got to go this one. Year after year after year. All you got to do is read my instructions and you can figure it out that we're just done with the bullshit, man. You got to do the shit right or don't do it at all. I'm, I'm at to the point right now, I don't want... I'm just ready to give their money back if they're going to give me any shit. You know, if you don't follow the instructions and you're going to start flipping me and shit and and expecting that that I'm going to just jump out of bed at three o'clock in the morning to answer your question. No, here's your money. Go away. You know, it's getting old, man. Yeah, look, I can certainly appreciate that when you hear stories from some of the older members in the community who are like, man, back in the day, you know, I'm sending off money to Amsterdam's not tracked like you know you just got to put your faith in it and it all worked out <laughs> oh man not only that but all these guys they, they rip you off man you know oh I didn't get my seeds they'll the classic oh I didn't get my seeds trip you know so every order man guess what tracking now we don't have oh I don't get and get my seeds you know we've seen every trick in the book man you know I would say 50% of the time, it's a positive experience. 50% of the time, it's a pain in the fucking ass. Because these guys are really fucking entitled, man. You know? Um, Look, yeah, as someone who has sold seeds themselves, uh, I certainly feel like there are some very high expectations at times. Like, I remember one guy, he, like, made payment on the seeds, and, like, within an hour, he's like, where's the tracking number? It's like... Hey, That's what I'm minute. talking about. Just give me a minute, bro. Who are these guys, man? What do you think, man? That, that like, a fucking drone is just going to come drop them at your fucking feet in five minutes? So what we do is we take orders. We have a, a thing now where we take orders for two weeks, and then we pack seeds, and we send them to our distributor, who then sends them to you. Because we're done, man. We're done going to post offices. It doesn't work anymore for us. We Guardian Family Tree is our distributor now, and we're, we're happy to work with them, and they're doing a good job, and they're getting our shit out there, and there's a lot less mix-ups now. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And, and there you go. For anyone who's keen on getting some of your gear, that sounds like a good spot to stop by. Do they have an Instagram or their primarily website sort of thing? I believe they have a website and they have an Instagram page, and they distribute other people's seeds as well. Yeah, fantastic. I, I found myself working with seed banks who prioritize like customer service and quick shipping has always worked really well. Yeah, if, if you have a good relationship with people and everything's flowing good and right, everybody's happy, man. You know, these guys get their seeds in, in, a, in a decent amount of time. and But, you know, sometimes weird shit happens, you know. As a, a more personal question, I, I was lucky enough to be gifted uh, some of your NL5 Haze. I believe it's the F4. It could be the F5. I think it's the F4. I wanted to know, you got any tips for me? Any certain phenos you think I should keep an eye out for? What's your recommendations? The F4 is pr- will probably probably be pretty good, but it's not as refined as the F6, you know, because every time I, I go through them, I go through a lot of numbers and I always get rid of the shit. 
you know, there was that there was intersects in that line from the beginning. And now at F6, I don't see I don't see intersects anymore. So that's wow, good. That's... So it's possible in the F4 you might see some nanner, maybe, but unlikely. I would say 99% no, you know, but you're going to see more sativa expressions back at F4. Oh, more hay. That, that's got me excited. <laughs> yeah, and it's no joke, man. You know, this is an herb that you're like, it's going to sit in your jar for maybe a year because you're, you know, you're not going to smoke it that much, you know? <laughs> oh, you got me excited now. That's, that's amazing. So, oh, and I was also going to say, I, uh, I feel like as growers, people need to accept that every now and again, you're going to get a plant with a nana and that's okay. You know, the world keeps turning. It's all good. Well, here's, a, here's something that people don't realize is that you can take these stable lines and, and give them a little bit of stress and guess what happens? I'm out, yeah. Stress anything. And, and, and stuff, man, that I've, I've worked so hard on and I give it a little stress and boom, you know? It's just the nature of the beast, man. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't get rid of something that's part of it. Yeah. You know, and if you bring any condition that's going to wake that up, it's going to wake up, you know. Certainly. Look, let's, uh, <laughs> let's go back to the question we used to start off the interviews with. Tell me about your very first experience with cannabis. Oh, you know, probably as a kid. You know, I started smoking herb in the 70s, you know, back then parents smoked herb with their kids. It was like, you know, it wasn't so frowned upon. It, you know, people think, oh, what was the 70s like? Well, everybody smoked pot, man. Everywhere you went, everybody smoked pot, you know. So but I didn't tell my mom I was smoking pot in fourth grade, man, you know. I'd, I'd go out with my friends after pinching some tie stick off them or something and, 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 and go smoke it after school with them and chase ducks at the park or something, you know, play football or Frisbee or something, <laughs> you know, until we had to go home and eat. And then I guess somewhere around sixth grade, I I'd went and lived with my dad. My dad was way more heady, you know, biker. He was, he, he didn't give a fuck. He was like, yeah. Whatever, just don't make a habit out of it. So, you know, we get big. But when I was 13, 14, I was getting bong hits for allowance, man. Every day, dude would leave a bong hit on the counter for me and my brother after we got on the bus because he didn't want us. He didn't put the weed out before, you know, we got on the bus. But after school, man, whoa, we'd race each other home, you know, to get the bong first. Sure shit, man. And he wanted us to do our chores first. You know, do the dishes, clean up the house, vacuum and all this other shit before we smoked our herb because he knew, you know, if we smoked our herb, we just sit there and go. <laughs> so we we obliged him. We did our chores first before we smoked our herb and everything. But that's how our, our lives were. We scored weed for our parents all throughout our teenage years, you know. Yeah. Wow. It does really make you realize it's been quite a shift in the dynamic, hasn't there? It's a different, it was a different world growing up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, it was, it really was, it was like, we were just isolated from the rest of the world as far as like the cannabis culture thing went, you know, that you had your cannabis culture in California, which was kind of like the culture up here, but I don't know. We just had our own little bubble up here, you know? Yeah. It's very lucky indeed. So if we move forward a little bit, what, stimulated you to do your first grow well i'd grown herb you know like i said as a as a kid with my parents we just that's what we did so i took care of the plants as they did we watered them blah 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 blah, blah. but i didn't grow myself you know because I, i'd left home and wanted to just go be a person you know I did all that shit went to college grateful dead and all that shit and and just my fascination still lied in cannabis you know, I wanted to be one of these guys. I didn't realize it back then, but I wanted to be one of these guys with a white lab coat and working in, in a lab and taking tissue cultures and doing all this crazy shit. But I didn't realize back then that I was working for the wrong team if I was going to continue down that path. You know what I mean? So I made a decision, you know, after all several Grateful Dead shows 
to, to, to freelance this and do it myself. You know what I mean? So I started, you know, I started breeding probably, oh, 93, throwing pollen around and making my own seeds just for environmental purposes, because most of the stuff that we were getting out of the seed banks or a cut from your buddy or whatever, your half gooey cut you got, it didn't make it, man. You know, we're up here, we're getting frosts in September. We want a crop that finishes. So that's what I started doing. I started breeding for crops that finished. So by 2000, I had types that, you know, that would, could withstand cellular damage of, you know, minus whatever degrees and they would finish in, you know, early October and you'd get a harvest. And what's one of the first creations you made where you were like really proud of it and you were like, fuck, I could like sell this basically. Oh, I think it was, uh, I got uh, what used to be called Eugene Green and I crossed it to uh, an old Oregon blueberry and then I crossed it to the Alaskan thunderfuck an old Alaskan thunderfuck from up here that was that had been around a long time, probably 30 years. The guy grew at 7,000 feet and it's just a month, you know. Some of the phenotypes finish in July. Some of them finish in October. Some of them are two feet high. Some of them are 14 feet high, you know. But it was the real Alaskan thunderfuck, a nice red, you know, dark plants, that, that Alaskan smell and everything. So I knew that that's what I got to work with if I want to bring this modern flower into this bag. You know, and I did. Out of curiosity, I think I'm just probably a, a bit uneducated in this aspect. What do you think are the genetics behind the uh, ATF? Oh, it's a, it's got a Russian in it for sure, a Ruderalis. But I don't think it was a tribal, you know, like nowadays. It wasn't a, a, a tribal drug type. It was just a fucking Ruderalis. Nowadays, you have tribal drug, drug types that are autoflowers from as far north as 50, 50 degrees. And I got a bunch of them, man, you know, but auto flowers don't fascinate me. I think that's just dumb. You know, it's boring breeding. It's boring. Do you think to a certain extent that autos are sort of always going to be somewhat inferior to photo period? Or do you think there will come a day where they're a bit more equal playing field? I got a, a friend right now who last year did nothing but breed autos. And the results were pretty neat, man. He used a bunch of my stuff. And I was like, wow, that looks just like the original, you know? So there's potential in it and there's use in it. Absolutely. You know, but I wouldn't say I'm like Jeff Lowenfels and I'm going to predict that's going to be the wave of the future. Yeah. I remember when he uh, said that on the show, I'm sure he said it other places as well, but he, when he said it on the show, there was a few listeners who were like, I'm not sure that'll be the case. No, I, I gave him some of the one by a Kazakhstan, too, to take up to Alaska. <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to it, but I'm pretty sure, you know, it, it throw off those autoflower traits up there. You know? Yeah, nice, 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 nice. So I don't think I've asked you, but I'd be interested to know, do you consider yourself more of a concentrate or flower guy? I like flowers, man. I don't smoke that shit. <laughs> Hell yeah, you rip it, you're a bong guy or joints? Or? Yeah, bong, man, bong, bong, bong. Since I was like, you know, 14 years old or some shit, bong it up. You know, some some period in my life, somewhere in my 20s, I thought joints was cool while I was, while I was driving concrete mixer or something, you know. But I can't even smoke a joint without hacking now, man, you know. It's paper, I can't stand that paper, man, you know. And the dabs, dude, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not into it, man. I get so much more out of the flower. So much more. So much more pleasure. So much more effect than this just big glob of fucking, bleh, you know? I it's think it's you silly just... humans, you know, always wanting more. Uh, yeah, I think you just perfectly expressed my feelings on that as well. Like, yeah, I just get so much more out of flowers and I never really vibe with the dabs but I think it's probably related to tolerance and whatnot and I, I think there's value to keeping your tolerance to dabs low yeah I wouldn't I just why you know like I said I can take one hit of black Colombian and be keyed up right you know function talk be 
know? So w- we sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'd love to just flesh it out slightly more. What was the last thing you smoked that left a really lasting, impactful memory for you where you were like, wow, that was neat? Well, harken by chocolate dye. Yeah. Good, good stuff, man. Like right there. That's that's what I'm after. That's that's it, man. That's it. You know? And I don't want to say it too loud, but I guess I just did, you know, because I don't got many seeds left. But you know, once you say that, people want them. It's the truth, it's really nice herb, dude. You know, it's like one hit, and you're like, wow, this is cool. Like you feel like a little kid again. You know? Yeah, it sounds like it could be like very haze esque. It's it's nice. Um, some of the phenotypes are maybe too potent, you know, for functionality, but most of them were pretty good. And if you find the right one, so so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna make a blueberry just because just because I can and I, because I have Velvet Rush, you know, you know what that is. I was going to ask, I got a question. Tell me about Velvet Rush. Okay. Velvet Rush is Afghani number one by Highland Blue Tie. And it's the brother of Eternal Love's Highland Blue Tie. And it was imported from 76 to 77 for 15 months in military cargo shipments via plane that landed in 29 Palms. Okay. Now, when they distributed it, it was the best thing going around. But it only lasted for 15 months because when the man got wind of it, they shut it down. So that's why that little amount of Highland Blue Tie was around. So collectors, you know, Mel Frank, DJ, whoever, obviously found out about it and got a hold of it. You know? Well, anyway, it was DJ who who crossed the Highland Blue Tie to the Afghani number one, the Kabul. It was mailed. From Kabul in 79 to Mel Frank, you know. Uh. That's what it is. Okay. So what happened was DJ worked the line and somewhere back there in his workings gave some seed to Mel. Okay. Now, when the Brotherhood had a barbecue in Eugene, Oregon in 1986, Mel Frank was there and so was Coop. And so were other Brotherhood guys. So Coot and Mel hit it off. Mel gave back the Brotherhood the Velvet Rush. The other half, you know, it was, it was molested, but the Highland Blue Tie got back to the Brotherhood. So Coot gave it to the Brotherhood down in San Clemente, and they took it in the hills, and they grew it for six or seven years. And they said <laughs> it was amazing. They said every color in the rainbow was in the plants. They were nothing but bud. They looked like Christmas trees. They're probably 20 feet tall, um, just monsters. And they did that for however many years, five, six years, and then put the seed, you know, put the seed away for however long that was, from 91 till 2010, when I got it and opened them up and repopulated them. And yeah, I did give it back to DJ, okay? Like, pretty quickly, too. Like, here, man. You know, no thanks, no nothing. You know what I mean? Just whatever. And I went, I went on his page and I see Mag and posted, oh, Velvet Rush and blah, 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 blah. Look, look, it's cool. Not a word. You know, they're just scared that I was going to do what I did with it. Well, after being just dissed, I did. I released it. Hell yeah, it was the Brotherhood line. It's not yours anymore. You know? So... That's what I did. I just, I just, I just IBL it and keep it as original. So we have Afghani one by Island Blue Tie, and I have the Wahawken by the Chocolate Tie. So I'm just gonna fuck it up, put them together, man. Make a blueberry. There's no fucking patent on that shit. You know? Can we expect to see that offering? Yeah, we'll do that this year. Cause I'm halfway through it. <laughs> That'll be neat for sure, because I know a lot of people really want that, like, F1 blueberry, not, like, the F5 or whatever DJ's got it at. Well, it's not that I'm trying to copy the guy. I just have a fascination in how that happened, and I want to see it for myself. I just want to experience 
that for myself and my, through my own hands. Not that I'm going to, oh, I'm going to make a bunch of money and yeah, yeah, fuck you. No, it's not my trip, man. You know, <laughs> I just, I'm more, I'm more into just seeing I, the fascination of the line, you know, how these things work together. The way the Oaxacan works with the chocolate and the way the, 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 the tie works with the Afghani in there. And that Afghan shit, dude, that's one of the shittiest Afghans, you know? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, that's really interesting for me because I think the thing that you consistently read about blueberry is that people are like, I want the early version, which had like, you know, the blueberry muffin sort of smell. The new one, it, it doesn't even smell blueberry. And I always wondered, like, why did he, like, he says, oh, you know, I, I bred for the effect, not the flavor. And it's like, yeah, but if you had blueberry muffin... Like why would oh, you? Oh, the effect on the old blueberry. This morning I smoked some old blueberry by Velvet Rush. Okay, a back cross to Velvet Rush. This fucking dynamite. One wow. hit, boom! Whoa, I'm going to the hotel. La, 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 la. You know, whoa, I'm here. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Potent shit, man. But it, there's not a lot of berry flavor in it. It's it's kind of just Highland blue tie. You know. Yeah. Now, the old Oregon blueberry, which I have had and have and worked with, I didn't never get any mails out of the old pack I got. So that's why I didn't do the line. But I did outcross to appropriate types. And like I said, I did the back cross to Velvet Rush just because. And are they available at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> but there's intersects in the line, I'll tell you. But the good ones yeah. are good. You know, they're good. It's like one hit, pow, this is, this is what blueberry is supposed to be. Now, somewhere in, I don't know when DJ did it, but he put another indica in the blueberry, and that's, that's what the world knew as blueberry when it was released. That nice, glossy leather leaf. And I'm saying it was an NL. I think it was an NL. NL1 or NL5 or something. As in, like, just to confirm, like, as in he had, like, a sort of blueberry clone and then he hit something to that and then those were sort of the seeds that you think went out? The whole profile changed from sativa to indica, like, overnight. And the people were like, huh? You know, what happened? That's not the Oregon blueberry sativa, we know. Yeah, okay. Uh, that that was awesome to hear about that. Everyone, I, I recommend you go grab those seeds. Um, I, I did want to just jump to a, a different cross of yours for a moment um, because I had noticed that you released the, the Nigerian Sunshine a while ago and that also used the, the Blue Moon Rocks. Was that the same mail that you crossed to the one? Yep. It was, it was the same mail I used on all the Blue Moon, Blue Moon Rocks crossings. So that's why all those look the same. That big, giant, bog, bubblegum, flower top, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. And I mean, would you be able to give us any of the backstory on the Nigerian? I think Nigerians are a strain that are always well-received, but hard to find info on. Okay, this Nigerian is a brotherhood Nigerian. Um, it was brought back from Nigeria in 1976 by a be a brotherhood couple who were fleeing persecution from the feds, you know, and went to Africa to look for exotic textiles. And that's what they brought back. Now they grew it from seed and found that particular cut that I had and a couple and another one. So there were two cuts that they'd had since like 1978 or 79 kept as cuts. And I was like, what? And there was nothing on earth like this, okay? Nothing on earth like this. There's a Nigerian out in California, some big sur somewhere that's the same one. But it's not the same one. It's busted up. It's outcrossed. Now, I, I, know, I know the cat who has this. Who, he also had the Brotherhood Corella. And he also had the sister, the only other living sister of the one in Blue Orca, which they call Mary Poppins. And at the time, man, I was like, God, I don't just want to take it, all these guys as shit like I'm just greedy. So I didn't, oh, no, it's cool, man. It's cool. You know? And now I'm just kicking myself in the ass about it because I could have had that Corella and Mary Poppins. And... But the Nigerian was lost, okay? It was a 76 Nigerian. It was beautiful. One hit, man, you're on a rocket ride like you've never been on in your life. And when I outcrossed it to... Um, 
And a former employee lost the cut. So I don't have it. It killed it, lost it, gone. So the only thing I had is, is the Bloomin' Rocks. And, and everything, every time I get into that line, I'm always looking for that Nigerian, you know? Um, there's a guy, uh, boy, I forget his name, uh, Synergy Genetics on Instagram. He, he is a nice expression of a Nigerian sunshine with that Nigerian expression popping out nice and big. If you want to, if you want to see what you're looking at, there we go. We'll have to all go suss that out. I mean, if we quickly jump to another strain that I think uh, is quite notable, I'd be really grateful to hear your thoughts on Cherry Bomb. You know, like the the infamous Maui Waui sort of variety. It's it's not one you find a lot of info on, but you hear it whispered about it by the heads. Yeah, Mister Green Jeans gave me the line. He, you know, he gave me the permission to breed and sell it and i don't know what what happened to the guy he seemed dropped off the earth man for a number of years and people thought he was dead or something well he wasn't dead we don't know what happened but anyway he said here the line's yours so i'm like okay now there's always been intersex in cherry bomb okay it's a real maui wowie it's a it's a it's it's an it's a oahakan by a brotherhood afghani it's brotherhood oahakan by brotherhood afghani that's what it is there's no tie in it um, what can I tell you about it? It's mostly sativa. And the reason that they think all these Maui's, you know, most Maui's, in fact, all Maui's have intersex problems. Now they say it's because of the city lights when they were breeding it back in the 70s. Now, I, I just don't know, you know, it could be. But anyway, the line carries intersex. And since I got a hold of it, I've bred it for 10 years. And every time I get in there, I try to get rid of that shit, man. You know? So now we're sitting pretty good. We're sitting pretty good with our cherry bomb. It's, it's pretty clean. I like it. But it's, but it's just cherry. It's just cherry bomb. It's just, a, it's just a Maui. It's not. There's no tie in it. There's no. It's, it's what I call medium duty herb. You know, it's stuff you'd give your mom or your dad, and, you know, and not, not wig them out. Novelty stuff. Here, mom, have some Maui Wowie. <laughs> that's that's so interesting because I think like I, I I'd be interested to ask you, you earlier. You mentioned that you know the Brotherhood was sort of like a combo of like bikers and surfers, and so d- do you feel like the genetics, like the breeding itself, was mostly done by sort of the more surfer side of bowl, or it was literally by a mixture? Yeah, it was the, it was straight up hippies, and these weren't just hippies, man. These were freaks, you know. They're they had some far out philosophies, and they're chowing on LSD and DMT, and they were woo, you know. But they were the biggest distributors of hash and herb and LSD on the coast. They had a pretty big organization, and they were they were doing it. But by 1971, they were all busted up. CIA got in there and. Got them. That's why they all fled, you know? And the only reason that this stuff keeps popping up, oh, 76, 77, blah, 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 is because they would meet up later and say, hey, let's do it again. Let's take one more run around the track. That's that's nice. I mean, uh, we're going to loop back, but before we do, you mentioned 76, 77, and it just sprung a thought to mind. What's your thoughts on the whole Uncle Festa skunk story? I don't know, man. The plant kind of looks like an RKS, but I don't believe that the lineage goes back to 68. I don't fucking believe it because none of it adds up. Okay. The only thing that adds up is the, the leaf morphology and the fact that it may be from bikers, but it doesn't match with the rest of the stories. And the skunk isn't the skunk that, that fits the skunk, you know? Some people say, oh, yeah, man, it's, it's good, you know, but it's, it's not. And I'm not trying to diss it or anything, but it's, I don't think it's real. That's just my opinion. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I, did, oh, I, I remember now, I wanted to add in that uh, kudos to you with the cherry bomb because I, I did find some posts from Mr. Green Jeans last night when I was reading over to it, and he quite emphatically says in all his posts that he feels you improved the line from when he gave it to you. 
and he sort of talks. He didn't he didn't mention stability, which is interesting, but he just sort of generally says it's better. So I, I guess that's what he was talking about. Well, when I got it, there was a lot of sativa expressions. And like I said, when I when I breed, I try to breed, man. I'm not growing in a fucking shoebox in an apartment somewhere. I'm going to go and we're going to bust open a bunch of seed and we're going to do a proper selection. So when I saw that there was all these sativa expressions, I was like, oh, what happened to the indica, indica expressions? I want to put that back in there. I want to balance that out a little bit more. You know what I mean? So luckily I found a nice looking male fucking cherry bomb, man, you know, that had a nice fat indica profile. And I said, okay, here we go. Boom. So that, you know, it brought the indica back into the line. And now, and now we're, now we're a little more resin, you know? Hell yeah. Look, while we're on the topic, I'd love to ask you, are there any specific characteristics that you look for as a sign of a good male? Uh, males are really deceptive, you know, because they're all, they all look good. They all have a tendency to look good. You can't really tell until you really put it through the paces till you get it up and you beat it up a little bit. You know what I mean? You damage it, run into it, smack it around, you know, damage it is what I do to see how, how well that vigor continues. If, if it's going to lie to me, I'm going to know right away. They're tricky, man. They're tricky. They'll do things that you would not believe. You'll be looking down here for all for six months pulling males. And then six months later, look up, there's a male that somehow snuck around your 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 site and climbed up a fucking tree and put a big flower head above everybody and went boom. That's pretty neat. It's it's quite deceptive it's like these things have minds of their own i'm telling you okay but a, a good male is they're they're usually easy to find you know because they, they like to express them so they're like yeah i'm a male they're usually they usually look pretty good so i usually have like 10 20 good males i'm like oh no you know which one do i use <laughs> so i'll tell you what i i often use two males on one female yeah, I think that can be an interesting breeding technique, and I think there's a lot of reasons for doing that, for sure. Um, I, I guess to ask specifically, a lot of breeders commonly will say, oh, you know, I, I feel like the most vigorous, fastest-growing males, um, that can be a, a, a more hemp trait than a drug trait. Do you sort of disagree with that? Is there a standard process you go through of putting them through the gauntlet, so to speak? Yeah, it's it's that's just rumor, man, because just you know you could have a, a male that'll just boom 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 and just blow big fat leaves all over the place and he'd just be a monster you know and everything he does and every female he touches no matter what it is is always good that's like the nl5 haze you know you take any any nl5 haze good male and touch anything with it and it's fucking bomb so it's about 50 50 on that you know yes and no sure and uh, just as a, a sort of one, I probably should have asked back when we were talking about grow mediums, but I think you'd have a great answer for this. Do you use the same general sort of soil mix slash approach to growing when you say grow like a land race variety versus say something more, a little more modern, or do you find you have to factor in that sensitivity? It's all the same. It's, I, I use the same soil on everything. The traits that I recognize that, that are different are like drought tolerance, you know, like, okay, that one is from Sinai. That doesn't get water today because it's not going to like it. Don't give it water. You know, those are the, the growing, the things that I see is just environmental conditions, not more trait driven stuff because they all, they all behave the same as cannabis, you know, they flower, they, they grow the flower, they die. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. So I, uh, I, I took a look at the website and I noticed that uh, the 2022 menu, 
Um, looked like it was a lot more tighter, sort of more focused, a little scaled back than, say, the 2021 menu, which was a bit more comprehensive. Was there any particular reason you decided you want to sort of focus on a smaller number of varieties? I mean, it was still quite a few. I think it was like 10 or something, you know, not, not a small number by any means. But was there a reason you wanted to scale things back and just focus on these specific lines a little more? No, I'm just getting tired, man, you know. I, I figured, well, everybody's, you know, a couple of years ago, I figured, well, everybody's doing this. I better get out there and bust some ass. I better get out there and just kick ass. So I did, you know, two, three years in a row, just kicked ass. You know, woke up, microdosed every day, ate a good breakfast, you know, drinking spring water, running around half fucking naked and just, yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah. Moving pots around, soil, just throwing around like there's no tomorrow, you know breeding this, breeding that. I mean, there was a, there's a point where every day I'm going out and breeding and it's becoming a monotonous task where you're like, okay, I gotta go do this. And you're out there and you're, you're rubbing stems, you're checking leaf morphology, you're doing all this shit in the sun. And it's just like, it's a job, man. You know? Yeah. And, and after a couple of years of, of going on it on that scale, like I did, you know, that's epic. It's like a world fucking record two years in a row. After two years, after two years of that, dude, I was like, oh my God. This year, you know, I have the, all these projects. I just need to, to calm down. You know? <laughs> so I did. I just I just scaled back for my own health, really. You know, because I'm just running too hard, man. You know? Totally understandable. And I, I think a lot of people may not be aware. I, I certainly wasn't. Um that you, you sort of do a lot of your work off-grid. Is that correct? Yeah, all of my work is off-grid now. Yeah, okay. That's really interesting. Just, just yeah, yeah, I got out probably five years ago. Just just said, no, I'm not doing this anymore. Got out on the land and, you know, now we're doing domes, shit. How do you find that lifestyle? You feel like it's really conducive to sort of what you're doing and how you want to live? That's the only lifestyle for me. Yeah, it's, it's it's the only way for me, man. I drink spring water every day, you know. I get my water from the spring, you know. It's oh, beautiful. Spring water. I breathe clean air. I live 2,500 feet up on top of a mountain, you know. I mean, I have no neighbors. There's nobody around me. I have neighbors, you know, but you can't see them. Yeah. Just forest, a nice first forest that I'm in, you know. The dream. <laughs> it's pretty nice a lot you know it's harder to come by nowadays that's for sure you know it's, it's a lot of people wanting it it's a lot of work though man i wake up and i bust ass every day and that's another thing people don't understand man i'm off grid you know i gotta work to live i'm not sitting around online okay i gotta answer this guy's question because he needs to know you know priorities yeah <laughs> That's it. Yeah, you know what? You made me just feel so lazy because it's like, yeah, I could just sit here all day and like water's still going to be there when I want it. Where like, you got to go get it. Well, yeah, you know, and I'm pretty fit too, you know, because of this. Yeah, I get out there and throw shit around and fucking, you know, pretty fit. So it keeps me fit, keeps me healthy, it keeps me active. It's everything, you know, it's a lifestyle. <laughs> truly, truly. And I, you know, just the, the biggest thing is I never see a stoplight. Okay. I can drive miles and miles and miles and never see a stoplight. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's interesting. I, uh, I was, I was going to say, I, I, I normally ask breeders whether they feel it's necessary to be active on the Instagram scene in order to sort of be a breeder in the current market. So I'd really like to hear your, your opinions, not just because, you're obviously not as invested as others, but more importantly, because you're off the grid, like I'm sure that's an additional hurdle. It's the internet shit. You know, you, you, you don't get good bandwidth. You can't load pictures. Sometimes your messages don't come through. Sometimes you don't get your emails until two days later. You know, I have an antenna booster and everything. It's just how it is out in the middle of nowhere. They don't have the signal strength, you know? So yeah, <laughs> that's real. <laughs> Do, do you feel like it detrimentally affects your ability to interact with the market? Or you think like, no, I can still interact with the market. It's just, you know, once a week. No, because, 
because the way these apps are set up, they have advertising priority of bandwidth. Okay. Instagram priority, man. They got ads to run. You're going to get through. Now I may not be able to post pictures when I want, but I can eventually do it. I just got to wait for the bandwidth to come rolling around again and then we'll do it. So, but like you said, do these guys have to be on here? And at this point in the game, yes and no. If you don't make a presence, you're not going to be seen. You're going to get buried in the, in the, in the marketing. You're going to get buried. People aren't going to know you're there. You, got, you could be out here for 10, 15, 20 years, man, and get buried under all this stuff. Nobody even know you're there if you don't make a presence. So, yeah, you got you to gotta have a presence. You know, you have to have some kind of presence. Yeah, certainly. I guess the the follow-up to that I wanted to ask is, do you feel any level of, how shall I say, like disillusion with sort of the way the market trends are going? You know, at the moment, we're very much in the thick of the, the Mylar bag hype culture. Is there any part of the way that the trajectory of the scene's going that sort of has you a bit bummed? Or do you think like, no, it's, it's fine. It's just doing its thing. Well, you know what? A lot of the times I can predict what's going to happen next, but lately it's been really kind of chaotic with the marketing thing. It's really, which way is anything going to go? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty loud out there with noise, with, with products and people pumping this and people pumping that. It's like, I feel sorry for the consumer, man. Because they're getting hit with so much misinformation, they don't know what to do. I have more people now asking me what they want from me. And I have to tell them what they want from me than what they come to me and want. <laughs> I got to tell them, oh, you want, you want the Mazar gear. Oh, oh, you want the haze. Oh, you want, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? That's that's actually like a really unique perspective that I I think I'm gonna have to pay more thought to because yeah, I think I think it is hard as a newbie um, or someone who's just entering the market to know yeah, like what like what's true, what's false, uh, where do I, what what's correct? They don't know. They don't know because there's so much noise. There's so much misinformation. There's so much marketing. They can see that people are just trying to sell a product and that they don't give a fuck about you. You know? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that you, you mention that because I one of the criticisms I had heard of this show, in fact, is that... Um, you know, people might listen to certain things and, yeah, take it for gospel when really it's just one person's account of things and it's not necessarily true. And I I guess that's actually sort of one of the reasons why I started the show is that I, I never proclaim anything as 100% truth. I'm just trying to share everyone's stories and then you can pick and choose what you think is sort of the real deal. Um, but it, But it's interesting because, yeah, a lot of people do take what they read online as like 100% the truth and yeah maybe, maybe there's other aspects of the story which you know like like what we were talking about earlier when people maybe read a bad review online and they, they don't understand exactly yep they have no idea they're missed they're all the information that they're putting out there is false they have no clue nothing and and the re- the reality is it, it, there was a you know if you if you're going to get trolled by somebody that wants you not to succeed they're going to do it if they don't have nothing better to do that's what they're going to do and i got i got these guys all over me you know because i didn't give them 10,000 seed when they wanted it or whatever the fuck you know some some crazy demand or some crazy shit where i'm like okay well i'm just done with you bro you know and they get so butt hurt they got to go out there and talk mad shit you know, and it's mad shit too. And I get, I, I get on them fucking forum, get on them forums, forums, and I get on those platforms, man. I go in there and I chew their ass out. I give all the facts, I give all the information, and they fucking ban me and fucking I'm out of there and nobody hears the fucking truth. <laughs> oh, that's you know, fuck roll it up, fuck icy mag, fuck all those douchebags. There's douchebags, dude. You know, they, they, the way they slander people and, 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 and let people treat people the way they do, horrible. Yeah, look, I've been thinking as a, as a bit of a joke, we need, a, we need to breed some anti-grudge weed and just hand it around. I got tons of it, man. I don't, 
don't want to keep these grudges on people, man. I just want to progress and move forward and do all this dumb shit. But here they come again, you know, climbing up your coattails and, you know, trying to empty your pockets or something, you know, while you're, while you're giving water to your kid. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Okay. Um, I had I had one question that uh, it might might be a little bit of a funny one, but I I found an old forum post, and I'm not sure if it was tongue in cheek or what, but I was hoping you could give us the backstory where you had said that uh, you were selling some seeds, the Blue Orca Haze Cross, the Velvet Rush, and it was listed as fifty thousand dollars cash only. I was like, oh, that's got to be a, a funny story. What's the backstory behind that? <laughs> oh, it just did. That's what my competitors do. They'll get my shit. Cross it to what I ha- what I'm doing, and then go sneak around on Instagram to some auction and try to sell it for some ridiculous high price, you know. So I'm like, ooh, ten million dollars. And honestly, bro, I don't think any cut is worth more than five hundred dollars. Nothing, never, because. I have so met so much genetic potential in my library. I can do anything. Yeah, you've got you've definitely got the base palette to to mix the colors. And in in effect, terps, everything. Everything. It's just you know if you, if you, if what every breeder wants, they just want to be turned loose and and to breed. You know, it's it's always the fantasy of every serious breeder. It's just let me at them, let me let me out there, let, put me to work. You know, I want to I want to move through a select. I want to select out of ten thousand parents, man. Yeah, nice. Look, I'll uh, I'll I'll bring it up because I I think this was actually one of the things which I saw recently and it stimulated me to message you was um. I think you put a post up relating to some of the comments uh, Todd McCormick had made about skunk. And uh, for the listeners of the show, they would know we had Todd on recently. Um, I just want to put it out there. I like Todd. I felt like I learned a lot during that chat. I I would love to know, you know, what was sort of some of the issues you took with some of the statements he made about the roadkill skunk? Oh, I don't know. I'm not not recalling anything on roadkill skunk i think most of the flack i'm getting from the todd camp is the nl1 stuff every time i post at neville's nl1 man i get an army of fucking trolls from todd's camp and i'm like no okay greg knew that nl1 was sent to amsterdam and neville put an afghan or a hindu on it and sent it back everybody knows that for years we knew that Howard Marks knows that. Everybody knows it. You just can't come along and change the narrative. Oh, that never happened. Every time I post NL1, man, I get that shit. You know? So I'm just over it. So Dwight, all these people that know the truth, just keep saying the truth. Over and over. And and Greg even says so himself, man. He he says says it himself. Listen to the interview, people. And I'm not making it, I'm not making any claims about anything. I'm just I'm just experiencing everything else everybody is. You know? Sure. And just for clarification, um when you say Greg's interview, that, that is that the one he did with Matt Wright? Oh yeah, I'm not sure which which one it was, but um yeah, he says it. He says it himself. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, for anyone who's keen to, to listen, I think that might have been um, the, the Breeders Syndicate podcast with Greg, so check it out. Interesting. Okay, so I, I guess it sounds like it's it's not so much that there's any sort of real beef, there's just a discrepancy and, and you feel like there's more people yeah. from his camp coming to yours. Every time Dwight posts this information, he gets trolled too. You know, he's on LinkedIn right now. He posts this information, he gets trolled. Anytime we post this information about what Neville did, we get trolled. And would you, just for anyone to save them sort of clicking around from different things, could you quickly recap that story for us about how it all went down? Which one is that? <laughs> the NL1. Or what I remember? You know, and I'm not on point because d- this isn't my shit, man. But, okay, this is what I know, okay? Greg sent Neville in cassette tapes 
the Pacific Northwest Hash Plant. Northern Lights, L-I-T-E-S. Okay. Neville got it. Neville bred it to his Afghan or Hindu, Afghan Hindu or Afghan hash plant, one of the two, and sent it back. Okay. That's when Greg or whoever, and they crossed it out to a bunch of shit and then sent it back. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it was like a back and forth sort of thing for a while. Just like we do nowadays, man. Same shit. Same shit. Totally, totally, totally. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So, you know, Neville did the work because Neville had the, the genetics. That's why Greg was working with him. You know? Yeah, sure. We actually had a, a fan submitted question about um, one of your NL5 BX. So, I, uh, yeah, NL5 Hayes. So, it might be a good time to bring it up. But um, our, our listener basically wanted to know if you had any information on what they or you called the Pine Box release of the NL5 Backcross. Oh, that's just one of the parents that had a really nice piney smell. You know, how the NL5s had that pine lime kind of thing. It's just really, really notable on that one. Nice. Okay, cool. I mean, they they also had a, a follow-up question where they were wondering, how potent is the NL5 cross haze F5? Oh, I don't know if we've to- talked about the F5, only the F4 and F6. Um, yeah. I didn't release a lot of F5s. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, only a few packs of those went out of the F5. I don't know why. I just I didn't do a big breeding of it. But okay. um, is, it, is it as potent? Thing. It's an IBL. So you're going to see the same traits of the NL5, NL5 Haze line every time. You're going to have indica expressions that finish earlier, and you're going to have Haze expressions that finish later. And we all know that the haze expression expressions are the ones that we tend to favor because the indica ones are more dull, boring, ugh, you know, ugly plants, small buds, they get mold, but the NL5 haze line itself doesn't really get mold. In, in any of the NL5 hazes, say across the different generations, were there any of the generations where you felt like you were getting the, the incense or like the church sort of smell from it? Yeah, absolutely, man. All through it, all through all of the lines, you know, F1, F2, all, all the way through it, the back crosses, everything. You know, I've done, a, I've, I've pretty much chopped it up into little pieces and, and took those expressions and isolated them and bred them out. This purple expression I brought out. This liquor, licorice expression I brought out. This expression, that expression. You know? So you can, individually, you can access those expressions if that's what you favor in those lines. You know? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. As a, as a follow-up, how does the, the blue orca haze compared to, say, the NL5 haze? Just because they are sort of similar in some respects. Blue orca haze, man, it's like the best weed on earth. It's like it's like NL5 Hayes went to heaven and came back and said, hey, we're all going to heaven now. <laughs> um, it cleans it up quite a bit. It takes the teeth chattering out of it. It takes the, the, the harsh vibe off of it. It takes. But one thing it does, it really creates a pretty powerful introspective behavior. And this is really unique, man, because most people that that it get those phenotypes will say the same thing. And I said, said the same thing forever. You know, you think Kelly mist was good. You think this was good. You think that was good. Smoke this, get on this. And you're not going to come off it for two years because nothing's better. Nothing. It's like, there's nothing better. No matter what, you know, I could tell, yeah, it's the truth. There's other types out there that are, that are, that will give it a run for the money. I'll be like, yeah, I want to smoke that too. But you know, I know what it does. <laughs> and the people that, uh, the people that grow it and have those, those cuts know what it does too. And they're out there. You can access these cuts that people have that they've kept. You know, if you do the research on blue Orca haze, you will, you will find the information. I put this shit out for over 10 years. Nice. I, you know, that brings us to the next question really nicely in that I noticed a lot of people sort of talking about their experiences of growing out the pure blue orca haze. And I think a lot of them sort of got the impression that it was going to be like a mostly haze sort of line. 
is that how you would describe it? Like, what should people expect <coughs> if they're going to grow that one out? No, I just named it as how we traditionally name lineages. You know, this and that. There's a pre- predominantly a large amount of haze in that in that breeding. Yeah. You know? So we got blue orchid. Hey, anything, every time anybody puts NL5 on anything, it's always a haze. You know what I mean? This haze, that haze, butt rump haze, whatever. You know, tobacco haze. Okay, so people can sort of expect like a mixture of like some sativa, some indica sort of stuff? Yep. Same thing as NL5 haze, man, really, because blue orchid is a Kandahar and a Thai. So you're putting the same ingredients in, but... It kind of really enhances it, like next level enhancement, you know? Yeah, nice. We've got a few more questions from our listeners before we sort of get on the tail end of things as we are getting there. But uh, they wanted to know, what's your experience with the lamb's breath? And do you think it's still around? Yeah, man. Well, the lamb's breath that I have was given to be- Vibes Collective gave it to me. They had it for whatever t- long. They said they had. They got it from Bushman, the reggae artist. It was in their family since mid '60s or something like that. Anyway, Vibes Collective. They got a hold of it. They got it in Spain. They lost it somehow. No. <laughs> um. Somebody had a pack from them, and they gave it to me. And I grew them out and I repopulate them. They're like, wow, cool. Thanks, man. Blah, blah, blah. And so I gave them that, gave it back to them. And they said, just keep it. Just it's yours, man. So apparently it's a real lamb spread. And the 77 Jamaican I ha- have is, is far superior. If you've seen pictures of that, which was taken out of the field in 77 by a friend. That's interesting, and the, I guess one of the reasons why I was curious about this was because I had seen your photo. It looks glorious, and uh, what I thought was interesting was whenever I talk to people about lamb's breath, lamb's bread, they all say, oh, you know, no, the one you're looking at, it's actually lamb's bread sour D hybrid that goes around, but people call it lamb's bread. Are you confident, like, yeah, that's, that's probably not the case? Absolutely, man. I'm pretty confident that I have a 100% Jamaican pre-1980 hybrid, man. So I crossed those two together and I called it Behingster Bread. And I, I gave a 20% por- portion out of every pack to the Behingster movement of Rastafari, which is Earl Chinna Smith, who was reggae. He's one of the greatest reggae guitarists ever. He's Bob Marley's guitarist, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, wow. That's, that's a beautiful sentiment to, to give back to the community. And, the, and, the la- and it's back on the island and they've told me they've wildfired it across the island. Fuck yeah, that's awesome to hear. And it's funny because uh, Dwight told me that he, they, they went to Jamaica years ago to go check out the Maroons back in the 80s or 90s or something. And they say they didn't have nothing then. And that's the, that's the story too, because I asked the Rostas, man, hey, go to the Maroons, go check out what people have. There's nothing out there. You know, it's gone. That's a real shame, isn't it? Seeing our seeing greenhouse go there and like some kind of super safari mission. I'm sorry, man, but there's nothing there. I just put it back on the island. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna go and find my stuff and pull it out of the bushes somewhere. Look what we found! It's <laughs> and get, trade him a bunch of Easter eggs for it. You know. <laughs> Well, it it does make me wonder why, because like I, I try to get over to like the states sort of once a year, maybe go to the Emerald Cup just to keep my finger on the pulse, and I I always see Ari in there, and he's always welcome with smiles and handshakes, and I'm like, why? It's just the name, man. Like I said, it's marketing. If you have a name or anything, you know what I mean? Who was it? Uh, what was it? Uh, uh what happened to Howard Marks, man? Didn't he pay like $60,000 just to have whoever it was use his likeness until he died or some shit? Oh, Shanty, Shanty Barber with Mr. Nice. You know, it's just, it's everything's for sale, it seems. Sure. <laughs> for like a very sort of specific type of question, do you think that, for example, you know, we already brought it up, the Greenhouse Seed Crew, do you think that there is some onus on them for like, the way they have arguably fucked various land races? 
I think it's fucked up. I think it's fucked up what they do. I think it's it's bad, 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 man. Going into these regions, taking out land races and leaving shit behind. That's fucked up, dude. You know, that's that's culturally, that's like colonialism, man. That's like Christopher Columbus shit, man. Totally. You know? totally. Get over <laughs> it. Get out. Get out. You know, get the fuck out of here. It's not proper. It's yeah. it's immoral. I was, yeah, I was trying to explain it to a friend who's not really involved in cannabis, so they sort of didn't understand it. And I was like, look, it's almost like they're, they're trademarking it in a way. Like, they go there, they get the pure, then they pollute it, and then they're the only ones with the pure. It's like they've got a copyright on it or something. You're like, they're the only ones who have got it. And then, on top of that, they're not. it's not like they're releasing the lines. Like, if they released pure stuff from Greenhouse, you could be like, oh, well, you know, there's some merit, but they're not even doing that. Well, the truth is, man, is when they left with when they when those guys all split off and, and got, you know, with what they got from Neville, it wasn't as good as what it was. And, I, and we all know that. I know it. Because my haze is, is better. My haze is better than their their theirs. Yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff. I, I we could probably riff on it forever. Um, one of the the other questions we got from one of our listeners was, uh, "Are you able to give us any information in regards to like the terps or the yields on the Congo cut used in the Congo Cross BP Congo?" That was really an interesting plant, and I got it from through a trade from some guy in Africa who was there and collected it himself. Um. It's greasy, super. Um, it, it has a lot of haze features, like it's the grease in the stem and the that that Karelian Indian scent. That there's there's only one plant on the earth that smells like haze, and it's a Karelian Indian. Now some Africans have that scent too, and this was one of them. You know, so when you come across that in any types out here on Earth, you're on to something. You know? Yeah. That's neat. That's neat. Um, I mean, we sort of touched on it earlier, but I, I'd love to just get a definitive answer. Um, what What's your thoughts on how Greg's Northern Lights compares to your one? Do you think they're more similar than different? Okay, I'm just going to say it, man. I think it's fake. I think it's a marketing play. I think it's not real. Okay? Here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> Long time ago, I had a conversation with with Kim Dog, okay, and he told me that it's not a Thai, it's not a Hawaiian, it was a Java Indonesian, and they called it. And I've heard of this before too. And other guys have come at me. Yep, they're saying, yep, that's what it is. It, it's a Java. It was. A, it's supposed to be extinct now. It was called. They called it the Java lime green, and they described it as clay on sticks. And when I saw this stuff out of that back cross, I was like, holy shit. I had never seen nothing like this in my entire fucking life. It was like clay on sticks, like clay. You could smoosh it like clay, you know? Wow. So with that, armed with that information, I began to dissect it. You know what I mean? Once I figured that out, that, oh, it's not a tie. It doesn't behave like a tie. And Neville doubted that too, because it didn't behave like a tie. Okay. So now we know that Herbie did NL5 and it was a Java lime green, whether he admits it or not, other people have. Okay. That's what separates that. Now, what was back to the other part of your question? Oh, Greg's NL5. So what I think they did was that whatever the story was about the seeds being in the sister's freezer or whatever, and he got them and he found them in L1, L2, and these are the original, blah, 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 blah. I think they did have that, but they pulled it out and they just crossed it to any tie to try in the hopes of having NL5 again. It didn't work. Okay. I got several pictures of these plants. I got a hold of Greg's five before other people did. Okay. Through some trading. And they're pretty hay. They're pretty. It's either NL1 or it's hay. Okay. Because that's what they did. They used NL1 by a mysterious tie. You can't fool me. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. Interesting stuff. That's that's really cool to hear that. Thanks. Thanks for the inside scoop. That's my opinion. I, I could be wrong, but I'm probably not. Yeah, sure. No, I get that. So, I mean, while we're on the topic of NL5 Haze, we had a viewer submit a question. Um, I'm hoping it won't ruffle anyone's feathers. It's not going to ruffle yours, but um, no. without so he says, without throwing the guy under the bus, I'd like to hear his experience on dealing with uh, mob seeds. I understand that mob advertises as ha, that he has a pure Acapulco gold, but it might actually be some NL5 hybrid. Okay, you ready for this? You ready for this? Okay, this was a guy we met online. Okay, and we said. Come on up here and, and we'll all go. I don't know if you know the story about Ken. Have you heard that name? No, I haven't. Anyway, he was he was part of our group, right? And we told Blue Jay, hey, come on up and invest. You will all grow a big garden together. You'll be just happy. Well, he got up here. He showed up with a U-Haul, some lights, and a box full of uh, weed in baby jars. It was so old, it was like, you know, it looked yellow, all of it. And he would, he'd open up and say, I don't smoke it, but here. And I'm like, what? What are you doing carrying all this shit around? And you don't even smoke weed. And he's like, it was, it was really puzzling to us because this guy kind of sold himself as somebody. And then when he shows up, he's somebody else. Okay. Now he's like, well, I don't know. I don't know if we have enough money to do this. I said, man, don't worry about the money. I can get the money, okay? Look, we're just going to do this. Don't worry about it. And he starts copping out. Oh, I don't know. And I think a lot of it, he starts asking questions about, so where's Coot live? Coot, you know, you could tell this guy's on a, and we start figuring out he's just on a mission to get genetics. Because he didn't want to, he, halfway through the night, he's like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't think we got enough money and blah, blah, blah. And he starts after, asking information about, how, hey, how can we get these cuts? Okay. And I told Coop, I said, hey, man, this guy's kind of weird. Anyway, that night, he takes off in the middle of the night. Okay. Just splits. Gone. What? Just like a weirdo. You know what I mean? And um, we're like, wow, I wonder what happened to him. What did we do? What did we say? Was it our hair? You know? Um, and that was that. And what, had, what he'd done is in the middle of the night, he went into the grow room and stole cuts. Okay? But he didn't get the, he didn't get the one or a blue orca because I, I'm just on the ball, man. I don't trust a fucker. Anybody. I, I'm, I know what you're up to. You know, so, <laughs> so he goes to Coot and I'd pre-warned him, Coot. And he, so Coot gives him BMR Backross 1. I don't know if he gave it to him in seed or cut, okay? I don't know where he got the Acapulco from, but that was my, my F2 NL5 Hayes cut he stole. So this guy goes out after he fucks us and just, you know, markets himself as whatever and this and that, starts taking my stuff, crossing it up and selling it and all this other shit. I'm like, wow, this guy. And then he takes Coots information that he said, don't, don't go and do this. I'm just sharing this information with you. He took Coots enzyme tea recipe and went and fucking sold it. Just a douchebag, dude. The guy's a douchebag. If I ever see that guy again, man, I'm appealing so hard. Just appealing. <laughs> yeah, look, that that's uh that's crazy. You know, you hear stories about cuttings getting stolen and stuff, and I mean, yeah, it's really frustrating stuff, I bet. Well then, then over the next ten years, the guy's releasing all your shit. Saying that he has the one and all this other shit. You know, and anytime anybody anybody confronts him, it's just ignore crickets and that's how a lot of these guys behave it's like you confront them and there's no accountability you know yeah i know that uh coot and him had had a falling out so i guess that sort of lends itself to what you're saying 
Yeah, that's the, all these falling outs with Coots is, 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 is has a lot to do with Coot and his medical condition. Okay. Okay. Um, I remember one time rolling up there and he, he'd been laying, he, he had back surgery. Okay. Is he broke his back and he could barely walk. And he laid there with his fucking back rotten out for however long on fucking opiates before if any, you did anything about it. I mean, sometimes he'd be on the ball. Sometimes a guy would be just like half dead. And like I said, the last time I talked to him, he had a heart attack and didn't know who in the hell we were. Said we lost his, lost his collection or whatever. And we're like, what? What are you talking about? You know, no clue. I would like to, to, to get to his wife one day and tell her, hey, you know, we, we don't know what's going on here, but we don't have really have any hard feelings here, you know? Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, it, it sounds like a medically complicated situation and, you know, obviously we wish Coot all the best, but, um, yeah, it sounds like it would be hard for you with things sort of changing depending on his mood if that was how it was. We we actually had a, a really good question that I'm I'm a bit bummed I didn't come up with it myself to be honest um, from one of our listeners and they said do you have any secret inputs or advice for producing nice healthy seeds? Grow organic, use the soil food web. You know <laughs> that's that's it. Yeah, sure. And you reckon just you know your standard organics repertoire is going to give you some nice seeds? Well, here let me give you a soil recipe. This is really easy and anybody can do it, okay? One part peat, one part perlite, one part compost and earthworm castings in three equal portions. This is the Cornell University potting mix that's always been around that they buried because of petrochemical industry back in the 30s. This is the secret behind all your potting mixes. Hell yeah. I, uh, I definitely use that general combo. Okay. Add any food you want, add any calcium you want, add any whatever you want. That's the base mix. That's the mechanism. That's the battery. You're building a battery, okay? Yeah, I like that. That's a good analogy, charging the seed. Well, it's, it's, it, the soil is like a battery. It has those, those ionic charges in it. And when, we, when, we, when, we work, when the plant gets in there, it works with it through its exu- exudates. They're, they're ionic. It, it wants what it wants. It's like, okay, I need calcium. Boom! It sends the signal, and it happens. Yeah, nice. It releases it from the it releases it from the negative attraction site and t- uptakes it. You know, molecularly. Get into that. Get into what you learn about that. All of this grow shit just falls away, man. And you're like, you're just growing herb. <laughs> That's some great food for thought. I like that. I hadn't heard that uh, battery analogy, but it certainly actually makes sense. So that's really neat. Another question we got from the listeners was uh, someone sitting on a pack of your uh, Cascadian Frost cross UW hash plant. Um, any tips on that one, what they might be able to expect? Oh, those are pretty good, man. <laughs> They're nice and greasy and have nice big spears, you know, highly medical, you know, good stoner, stoner weed. Ain't nobody going to complain about that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, there you go. Whoever sent that one in, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't have your name on hand right now, but crack those bad boys. They're sounding good. So Nice. You know, me and, me and a buddy worked these, and we both did a good job. Lovely. So second last question. Uh, sorry, last question before we get into our quick fire questions which is sort of the final five or so but one of our listeners wanted to know if you had any sort of info about the thunderfuck haze um what that is it's um ak beans brains matt nuska and pharma's um shebergen afghani which was from land race uh you know i forget the damn name land race collections or whatever irizig now Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah Indian um, Land Race Exchange. Yes, um, just crossed together. I think AK did it. Sent it back to Mike. Mike sent them to me. Um, I said, "Yeah, I just I'll just put them on top of my Alaskan by you know, Hayes. You know, get get all those Alaskans in there together and see what they do. That's awesome. Get, get them all together and playing together. You know, so with a haze." <laughs> and it, it's just a novelty it, it wasn't a serious breed it was a novelty just to put the alaskans together 
you know, I didn't really work at it much. It, it's just a novelty. But yeah, it's probably good. That's awesome to hear. I, I think novelty strains can be cool, to be honest. But um, that's good. So we're on to our sort of final rundown of questions. So first one being, out of all the plants you've ever grown, I know there's probably countless is there one specific one that you really miss that you think back on at night and think, man, if only I still had that one? That's 76 Nigerian, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. What, a, what a kick in the ass that was, you know? And what a kick in the ass was to lose it, too. <laughs> like, I always sure. think about that. I always think about that plant, man, because it was so unique. You know, it was just absolutely unique. Nothing like it. Beautiful. Beautiful. And that's a, a great answer. And, and the next question is sort of a, a bit similar, but a little bit different at the same time. Do you have one specific memory of cannabis that to you is the most memorable? It might not necessarily be the strongest weed or anything, but it's just for whatever reason, it's memorable. Yeah, doing five-year mandatory minimum for growing weed. <laughs> that's a pretty good answer. That's memorable <laughs> shit right there. Five years in fucking prison, man. Out of, out of curiosity, when you got released, and, and by the way, thank you for your time. Um, when you got released, what was the first thing you smoked? You must have been thinking about it like, man, I'm going to puff on this one as soon as I get out. Um, actually, I was really serious when I got out because I didn't want to go back in. So I didn't smoke, you know, because I had to do drug testing. I was on, I got five and five. I buried a bus and fucking grew a bunch of weed in it and I got cracked, you know. Somebody narked on me because they got popped. Anyway, that's how it goes. But when I got out, I was like, oh, I don't want to smoke weed or grow weed. I'm going to be a good boy because I was getting drug tested. Right. Yeah. But then I moved. and I got a parole officer who was real cool. It's like, hey, man, I'm not going to drug test you. Just fucking smoke. I'm like, OK. So it was game on, you know, started growing again right away. Went and got a loan from a friend. You know, while on parole. So I started the seed company and it was growing on parole. Wow. Bless that parole officer. <laughs> yeah, so five five fucking years of dealing with these fucking trolls and being on parole, man. I, I there's some people I just wanted to fucking murder, you know? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I can imagine. All right. Well, let's go to the other end of the spectrum now. What was something that you were excited to try? People had talked it up to you and then you finally tried it and you were like, Oh, is that it? Cuban black haze. <laughs> you're gonna ruffle some feathers there it's just it's not it's not what i expected it's just it's just another variant of nl5 haze because i have a million of them you know yeah look i can only imagine you you probably do in fact it's neat it's cool i mean i appreciated it sure certainly i'm not dissing it in any way i'm just saying that it wasn't what i i expected it's nice it's, it's pretty cool but you know like I said, I got all pockets full of that stuff. Sure, 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 sure. So let's say I'm going to go drop you off on a desert island and you can only take three strains with you to grow for the rest of time. What three are you going to take? They can be either clones or packs of seeds if you want to do some breeding. The one, Mazarbite Giro and NL5 Haze. Hell yeah. You feel like you could probably make most things from those? Yeah. That's all there. That's everything. You know, yeah, nice. Everything you want. Okay, so on, on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to drop someone off on this desert island and you're not a big fan of them. You know, maybe one of these people who's given you grief over the years. What are you going to leave them with? NL5 Haze. <laughs> Just the one? <laughs> and, and Blue Orca Haze. So they get to know themselves a little bit better. Oh, that's nice. I like that. You know, the introspective angle, that's good. Yeah, to help you, you know, <laughs> help your problem. <laughs> so if there was one person you could select, alive or dead, who you could have a in-depth conversation with about cannabis, who would you want to have a sit-down chat with? Probably Neville, man. You know, I can't really think of anybody else. I talk to his best friend every day, and that's almost the same thing. But it'd be really interesting to pick his mind and, and because I kind of have the same thought patterns he did back in 1985 as far as hybridization goes. He was a breeder and he knew what he was doing. And I know what the fuck I'm doing, too. 
with it. I have a, there's a method to this madness. So we're on the same path. We're doing the same thing. So in a way, you could say, I'm continuing his work. And so is Dwight. We're both continuing his legacy by selecting exactly how he did. And by using his cues and what the information that he left behind and the information I'm getting from Dwight and the information that I have. And, you know? No, I, I agree with you. I think I would definitely pick Neville. It's whenever, whenever NL5 and Hayes is, is mentioned, there's always money and emotion involved. It's been that way since the beginning. It's, it's like a curse, you know? That's a good angle. I haven't heard that, yeah. So, on to our final question for the interview. If you had a time machine and you could go back anywhere in history, any place to collect either seeds or clones, where would you go and what would you collect? I'd probably show up in Laguna Beach and see what those guys had in their surfboards. In 1971. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice mixture because you could like get access to different things at the same time. Well, this was pre-Soviet war stuff too, you know. Yeah, um, I can only imagine the Afghans they had. Well, they're different, you know. That's why I'm like the one. It's, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Smoke that shit, you know. <laughs> that's incredible. So, look, I think with that, being said, we're, we're just about at the end of things. Were there any general comments or shout outs you would like to make? Oh, just anybody who supported me. Thank you very much, man. You know, we do this for you guys. You know, what I'm doing, I'm doing for other people so that you can experience that as yourself. So you can take that. That's something you can take to your life, to your, you can take that through life with you, you know? I'm just, I'm just, just doing the rough work out here. I'm just putting, I'm putting the pieces together. It's up to you to find the gold. And there's lots of gold in there, okay? That's, that's what I got to say. And also, I was here before that fucking Swami Select motherfucker too. Those fuckers tried suing me for my own fucking logo twice. And you cannot sue a religious icon. <laughs> you can't sue Jesus, man. <laughs> uh, you know it's funny I actually that that came up last night when I was writing questions their page came up and it's like we've asked him to change his name and I was like you haven't even provided me with proof that you were the first ones to have the name <laughs> I provided them with proof that I was first hey, it goes ignored they're capitalist they're fake I'm the real fake Swami man because Swami's Look, listen, man, swamis were fake to begin with. This was something that the Western world put together, okay? The swami figure, you know, the mystical, holding on to the crystal ball swami thing, you know? It's fake. It's not real. It never was. Not only that, he, pay, he makes people pay to watch him talk to fucking plants to ask him if they can be harvested. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> it's insane, okay? It's just nutty California nutty stuff, you know? It's a, it's a joke. Yeah, look, I can imagine. It's got to be frustrating. But, you know, thank you so much, Gas Canistan, for taking the time to come on the show today, for sharing a whole bunch of knowledge and a bunch of information about your crosses. We're really grateful to have had you on. Yeah, man. Thank you for the opportunity to let me say a few things that I kind of needed to say too. Because, like you said, man, there's there's a there's a handful of people that follow me around that are just disgruntled employees that like to to slander people like that, you know. And it comes from the forum days when we had to ban people that behaved poorly, from IC Mag all the way up through all the forums that we had. It is just reverberations of of, of poor poor taste. So anyway, peace. <laughs> there you have it my friends a huge thank you again to Gas for taking the time to come on the show share some of his history thoughts and knowledge likewise huge thank you to you the listener for making it this far I encourage you please go check out our sponsors they are truly fantastic. Seeds here now. Number one seed bank in the industry. Check them out, guys. They've got all the hottest drops. Likewise, keep your garden happy and healthy. 
get copper biological systems. These guys kill it. They'll keep your garden pets and pathogen free. Shout out to OGS, Organic Gardening Solutions, the Organic Homies Down Under, Top Shelf Seed Bank for all your genetic needs down under. And last but not least, huge shout out to the Patreon gang. You guys are truly the lifeblood of the show. Without you, episodes could not happen. If you're interested in helping support the show, all while getting early access to episodes, unheard additional content, prizes and giveaways, check out the Patreon. I guess that's it for this one, son. I'll see you for the next one. We'll see you.